Um, how many of you have never been to the Bread Beckers before? Anybody here, this is your first time. Welcome. Well, it is such a privilege and honor to have you here. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Um, we've got some great food that we're going to be serving. I hope you enjoy the oatmeal. I just fell in love with the picture of it. So I just was like, we got to have that. And the weather cooperated. Nice, cold morning. There's nothing more warming than a wonderful bowl of oatmeal with the apples and the Irish whiskey cream. Um, I tell you, that was a first for me, but um, that's okay. We, we love it. So um, very, very delicious. Um, little housekeeping. There's restrooms out this door to the right, down the hall. First door on your left is the restroom. Um, there is one past the, in that, through, in that kitchen room uh, beyond the sink. There's another one there if that one gets too backed up, but I don't think it's going to be too bad this morning. Um, exit doors in case of an emergency. There are exit doors through these curtains should you need to get out in a hurry. Of course, always where you came in, there's the exit that way, and it's not such a large crowd, but we feel like we have to tell you just in case there's a, an emergency. So, um, but if you, know, if you have a personal emergency, just exit the, out the door you came in. If you would, please, we are um, live streaming the class this morning and archiving the video taping of the class. So if you would please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent at this time, that would be wonderful so that we don't have that um, interruption of noise and everything going on um, during the class. Um, I, I hope you all got a handout. Um, I just want to say this to you. I, I just, in meeting Judith, I was just so taken with her in the very beginning, just meeting her. I, it was such a kindred spirit. And our hearts just bonded. I was actually introduced to her um, through my friend Sharon Feskanen over there, who's helping my son Caleb um, dish out food. And they came up one day to meet me. She brought Judith up to the store, and it was just instant friendship. We prayed out in the parking lot, and it was just like, yes, I want to carry your book. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm reading the book and picking out recipes and, that I was going to try, and I'm like, oh, wow, it's all white flour and white sugar. <laughs> what am I going to do? And um, I was like, didn't even think. I just loved her so much. I was like, yes, we want to carry this book. So um, I actually visited her house and took a mill, and we worked with some of the bread. And she fell in love with milling the wheat mm -hmm. and making the bread. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, this tastes like my grandmother's bread. Mm -hmm. So um, we uh, want you to know that we love the book. We're going to carry the book, but do know, please, and everything we're doing today, you can substitute the good flour, the good sweeteners, the healthy choices. Um, that's why we gave you in your handout, I gave you, um, instead of printing the recipes, because they were in the cookbook, so you didn't need me to print the recipes out, I did um, give you what we substituted in those recipes. Also in your handout, you should have gotten um, our printed um, Wiser Choice substitutions. That'll tell you how to make self-rising flour. It, one of the recipes today, I think, calls for self-rising flour, um, which, so that'll tell you how to do that, um, how to do Bisquick, which I don't think any of her recipes call for Bisquick. But, um, so we're going to walk you through the substitutions that we did today. So I just did have to, have to give that uh, little, 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 little plug there to why am I carrying a book that's white flour, white sugar? And I'll tell you, Judith, if you want to come on up, yeah. mm -hmm. I just, um, mm -hmm. oh, I hope I can do this without crying. <laughs> um, I just, mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure and the privilege of fellowshipping with Judith on a more personal um, note and level. And um, through my friend Sharon, mm -hmm. we've joined together and, and have a little prayer meeting, a ladies' prayer meeting, and um, very spiritually powerful meeting. And Last week when we were praying, um, particularly for Judith and just everything, the Lord just gave me such a clear word for her about her cookbook. And this is why I was so taken with the cookbook and didn't pay any attention to the recipes. <laughs> and it's because I fell in love, and this is what I shared with her that the Lord put on my heart. I fell in love with her, um, her love for her heritage. You know, not all of us come from great family backgrounds, and even of those that come from great family backgrounds, it's not all warm and fuzzy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> even though we have some great memories, there's some things, all of us, there's no perfect family. But what the Lord showed me so much was he laid on my heart the scripture in Malachi, um, chapter 4, verse 6, mm. and it says, 
And it's talking about in the last days. And it says, And he shall turn and reconcile the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children back to their father. And that's just what I told her. Her book is not, she doesn't talk about the Lord in there, but you see his hand everywhere. And that's what I just was so taken in that prayer meeting that last week. I said, what I see is your, your, your love for your family, your love for your heritage, and I think God is going to use this book mm -hmm. mightily to turn the hearts of children back to their homes and their families. And we're children, even mm -hmm. though we may be 60 or 70 <laughs> years old, I still have a mother and a father. And um, when I was coming here this morning, I thought of the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2, and it says, Honor your father and your mother, this is the first commandment with a promise that all may be well with you and that you may live a long life here on the earth. This is very important to honor your father and your mother. And like I said, I know that some of us maybe don't have fathers and mothers that may be worthy of honor, but they are in God's sight. And there's something you can find. They, they passed on some heritage to you, whether it's just being born in a land um, that you love or, or whatever. Um, I'm so thankful to my mother that taught me how to work, that taught me how to cook, and taught me how to be very loving and hospitable to other people less fortunate than myself. And so I just exhort you today to turn your heart towards your home and think about your rich heritage where you came from. Because like I said, it is rich, <laughs> maybe richer in some things than you'd rather not be there. But nonetheless, God says to honor your father and your mother, and he really doesn't give except unless they're, you know, whatever. But it says it's the first commandment with a promise that things will be well with you and you'll live a long life. So that's my prayer for you this morning as I introduce my good friend, Judith. And um, I just want to say a prayer before we get started. Judith and I have met briefly um, last week to kind of go over, um, mm -hmm. I made the sticky toffee pudding that I'm going to make mm -hmm. you because I wanted to get her approval of the healthy <laughs> ingredients. She loved it, so mm -hmm. we're going to serve that today. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of winging this today, <laughs> and um, we're just going to tag team when we need to, and Judith's never cooked in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I introduced her to pressure cooking, the dish we're doing for mm -hmm. you. She normally cooks four hours in the oven. I said, oh, we can do this. <laughs> we can do it in a pressure cooker. <laughs> and um, so mm -hmm. we, we've just, we've, so we're going to do some things. She, mm -hmm and uh, work together so it may not like be spot on mm -hmm. TV style but mm -hmm. um, it'll it'll be all right so we're gonna play pray a blessing mm -hmm. thank you Lord for this beautiful day I thank you for Judith I thank you for share her heart towards her family towards her heritage towards her mother her father her grandparents and I just thank you for her love of cooking and her willingness to come and share her life and her traditions and her her mm. her gift of cooking and making tasty food I just thank you for that. I thank you for the people here. Lord, may we, as we honor our fathers and our mothers and our families and our heritage, may we be a blessing to all those that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, now bless this time together. Order it. Just give us clear direction. And Lord, I pray a blessing over the food, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for signing up for this class. And it's just just so exciting to see so many people here that are interested and, and maybe have a, a link towards Scotland or Ireland. And when I moved over from Northern Ireland to Atlanta, Georgia, I couldn't get over the connection that I felt with the love of hospitality. And of course, I always say a teacup in every, in every hand and a church in every corner. It's so like Northern Ireland and my heritage. And the, I'm part of the Scots-Irish culture in Ireland. and. They, they are, their genealogy within the American South, they would have come over in about the 1800s before the Irish famine. And they really moved right from Virginia southward. So you've got this huge belt of Scots-Irish uh, right through from North Georgia throughout the Appalachian Mountains. And of course, the Irish brought the, the bluegrass music. They brought so much uh, culture and the, the clogging, the dancing. And I remember going to a farm in Alabama and just I just felt they, they got out the guitar and started to sing and I thought this is just like something in Northern Ireland where we'd have a barn dance and, and people would get together and, and dance and they'd have the music and there was something very familiar with the, the culture and especially when I go up to, to North Georgia and, and travel in the country, the, the, the more rural parts of the American site, that that's when, when I see the commonality in the culture. And uh, you know, it's, my, my food is, it's wonderful to be here with Sue 
and I have really been on a journey with, with food and uh, normally I, I don't have any scripture in, in the book, it's just purely a celebration of culture and heritage, uh, but it's, it's wonderful that Sue, you know, honours the, the Lord in her business and, and uh, that I'm able to, to bring that in, a little flavour of that in today as well, that I don't normally do in, in my cooking, but my family are from a Presbyterian heritage and my great, great, great grandfather, uh, it was during the 1859 revival in Ireland uh, that would also happened in New York City. There was a revival in, in spiritually in America as well at the time. But he was a farmer and somebody said to him, hey, can I uh, pitch a tent a for the revival in your land? And uh, my, my, my great-great-grandfather said, sure, you know, I'd be glad to donate the land. And uh, through the, these revival meetings, my great-great-great-grandfather uh, committed his life to Christ and kind of from him there's been a, a generation of, of Christian heritage in, in my family right down the several generations and uh, so that's kind of very much ingrained in who I am and uh, I've just been enjoying so much learning about from Sue about the, the whole whole foods and I'm learning from her as well about how certain foods are going to to make me feel for my well-being for my health and especially I turned 40 last year and I just realized that I can't eat everything that I ate when I was 20, you know, and, and get away with it. So I have been really learning about how foods work for my body and uh, how that, that responds. And uh, coming from Ireland, everything in Ireland is naturally or, organic anyway because the, the grass, the, the beef cattle are all grass fed. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and keep on talking, but I want to start with the food. And I'm going to just get this, this power going here, just switch this up a little bit to get this, the, the, the ribs, get this heated. So let me just introduce the first dish for you and I'll keep on talking with the stories uh, throughout my talk. I have some braised uh, beef short ribs and I grew up on a farm in, in Northern Ireland and my whole family were in the beef industry. My uh, several generations. My uncle is an auctioneer and my grandfather was an auctioneer and my father wasn't because he's a stutter but he's an incredible farmer. He's primarily a sheep farmer and he was actually stopped by speeding by the cops last year and going through a stop going through a, a 30 mile speed limit and the policeman said sir why were you driving so fast you were driving at 40 miles an hour in a 30 mile speed limit what were you thinking about and he stopped and he hesitated and he said sheep so my father thinks about sheep all the time because he's a sheep <laughs> farmer. So that, that was his response. But I always had fantastic uh, beef growing up in, in Ireland. We used to basically, in the farm, we used to have an animal. And it was probably sad, but it was an animal that we would have, have, have watched uh, growing up. And Daddy said, this is the one we're going to butcher. So we would have literally have had that and had a had and worked together with, with getting the meat and freezing the meat and so everything was basically farm to table. So I actually have some beef short ribs which is one of my, my signature dishes and I'm going to, hopefully this is, hopefully this is kind of hot, we want to have a nice sear uh, on the, this, I'll just give it one more minute. So I'm going to start off with seasoning this with a little bit of this wonderful salt that Sue introduced me to and uh, she was telling me about, I'm sure you guys all know about the, the color of the salt that Sue uses. And I, I didn't know that I normally use kosher salt, but this is just in, amazing. And uh, I'm learning, learning something every day and obviously lots of, of salt and pepper for flavor. And then we use some of the, of the flour as well. We just sprinkle over this here. And basically the key to, to cooking, to good cooking, is all about the braising of meat. That's how you really bring out the flavor. And Irish food, the recipes in my book, they're all simple, they're easy to use, and they're generally economical as well, uh, because I think that's important when feeding a family, uh, because uh, we all, we all have, have a budget, especially for bringing out the, those meals every day. So let me just uh, go ahead and just get this. Hopefully, I want to hear that nice, yeah, that's good, that, little, that sizzle on the, on the braise. Let me put some little bit of salt and pepper. Plenty of flavor. Why not? So you want to hear that nice, that nice uh, sizzle on that. And basically, 
I think that people sometimes are afraid to incorporate that flavor, but you want to get that nice brown flavor that you get in all of your meats. And it's the flavor from that that is going to produce uh, delicious uh, sauces, you know, no matter what, what you do. And uh, I know I made a pot of Irish uh, stew last night for, for my family uh, with the lamb, with the brazen lamb that, that's in there. And it's really so simple, but I just, I basically just made sure I braise the same principle, braising the lamb off really nicely to get that wonderful brown crust that you're looking for. And then, you know, once you have the key of that to your flavor, you add your veggies and you've got something that is, that is incredible. And Irish food, it's, it's my recipes, it's, they're, they're generally one pot dishes that you can make. They're wholesome and nutritious and they're, they're easy. The only thing is, Sometimes they do take a slow time. You need to physically be there for a one pot dish because it's not gonna happen in five minutes, but it's pretty easy to prepare, but you just need to have the time to be there. But obviously with Sue having this pressure cooker, I've never actually worked with a pressure cooker before, but it is amazing that you can have a, a dish like this, which she's gonna prepare this. I normally cook this for about three to four hours uh, in the oven, but this can, can be done in 40 minutes today. So I'm going ahead and just see that, that nice, that nice color that, that we're looking for, that nice sear. And I have another, one of my other signature dishes is the braised beef, which is, uh, it's about this, the first chapter as well. And it is, it's wonderful. I use the, the mock tenderloin. It's a, a cheaper cut of meat, it's from the shoulder. It's very inexpensive, but it's, it's fabulous as well. And the, the ribs are kind of a little bit more special. This is uh, something that I would use for, for gathering of, of friends, or it's kind of a, of a real treat, a celebration meal. But I do use the other beef, the, the mock tenderloin, for family meals because it's a more economical cut of meat. Okay, so that's pretty good. So that's, we'll just set these into the, the pressure cooker here. I've already braised off the, the last of that. So when we do that, it's just really simple. We're just at this stage, we're just going to add the, uh, the various, sometimes I do because there is some, some flavor in here and I don't want to, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and just uh, incorporate these, these vegetables a little bit because we don't wanna miss out on, on any flavor. You see. Okay. So I'll just get that, just get that going in there. And meanwhile, I'll go ahead and just add the liquids that, that we need for, for the dish. First of all, we're going to add the stock. And I'm just going to kind of add enough liquids. Sue, so, so do you want to add the broth, the chicken broth okay. liquid? And the, I, I, my passion is making uh, entrees and comfort dishes, soups. So I'm not really big into measuring a lot of stuff. I kind of judge it, so I have to obviously step it up for the cookbook. With baking, you can't do that, but with, um, when you're dealing with, I'll probably add most of that just to, just to cover that. When you're baking, you can't get away with that. It has to be an exact science. <laughs> but for cooking, you kind of go with the feel, you know, go with it with the dish. So for the Guinness, I just have to to check the check to see what, what the, the chef came up with here for the, the the amount of Guinness. So it's it's one ounce, so it's an entire entire bottle of Guinness. Now Guinness is uh, is good for you in Ireland. That's, that's what we all we always say. That's the advertisement, and believe it or not, it, it is yes. Sorry. Veal veal stock. Well, we're using beef broth instead yeah, of beef stock. Yes, you can yes. Either one, if you can't find yeah. the veal stock. Yeah, I've made made this restaurant this in a lot of restaurants for. I made this for Murphy's yeah. restaurant in Virginia Highlands for St Patrick's Day and. They always have veal stock in, in a restaurant, kind of, so that was why I'd kind of I'd made it for them. But you can obviously substitute any type of, of stock for, for, that, for that at all. 
And Guinness is, it, the, the hoppy flavors go really well with beef. And don't worry because the alcohol does evaporate, your children will not, uh, you know, you can feed it to your, your family, but it is, I cook a lot uh, with, with Guinness. And sometimes it goes into the food as well. No, but, but, <laughs> but the, the, the flavor is really good with, with meat. And, uh, you know, so you'll really, really enjoy that. And also it helps to tenderize the ribs and the meat and just makes it all fall apart. So the next thing we're going to add is molasses. And, and my father used to say to me when I wasn't behaving well, he said, you're as slow as molasses. Did you ever hear that saying? So, and when you work with molasses and start to pour, you'll realize where that saying comes from, because sometimes it can be a pretty slow pour. So how, how much of this is a quarter about cup? Or? A quarter cup. Oh, about is, a quarter cup, just yeah. about that there. Yeah. So you can, although this one seems to be moving okay. Sometimes if you get a, yeah. and you think of molasses, it, it takes forever to, to get it out, but when you're, when you're holding it like this, you can see where, where the saying comes from. I grew up on a farm and we all had to work hard. And my father, when he was moving sheep, he always liked us to move fast. And uh, when I married my husband, he grew up in the town. And when he came out to the country to, uh, to meet my family, we were all sitting around the fire and my father comes in and he shouts, sheep to move. And uh, immediately, my mother, we all ran and got on our Wellington boots as fast as we could. And we knew exactly what we had to do. And my, my husband could feel all the tension and the stress. And, and uh, he was totally blown away. But we were all new. Whenever my father said, sheep to move, we had to be on it. So um, it's a bit like that with, with, with cooking as well. Sometimes you just have to, you have to move, move with the action. That's why I enjoy the, the, the buzz of the kitchen so much. So. What else do we, do we need? I think we're, we're pretty good. We've got the stock. In fact, we don't even, I was just trying to, to incorporate those juice, so we can just go ahead, Sue, and put that, and put that, put that in a little bit. And we're, we're, we're really all good. So we're just, we're basically putting the liquid in, and the, the vegetables, when I do this in restaurants, I normally, I normally strain the vegetables and use that as a flavoring for the meat. Um, but obviously with Sue, we're using whole foods uh, for the family in the bread bakers. So we, we're basically incorporating, you know, holistically all the vegetables and everything in that. Uh, but if you, if you did want to, to strain the vegetables and use that as flavoring, if you were doing a more upscale dinner party, you can certainly do that. That's the way I would normally serve it in a restaurant. But for the family, uh, you, we, we're basically incorporating those, those flavors within the dish. And, uh, but you, you obviously have that option to, to do that. And we have the, the apples give a wonderful flavor, which is uh, uh, almost like that, that citrus flavor. And uh, then we have the, the sweetness coming in from the, uh, from the molasses. And uh, it, it all kind of comes together. And then we have, do we have the bouquet garni as well? So yeah, yeah, sure. I can go, yeah, I'll go ahead and, yeah. You know, you don't need to be super fussy with that, but I just wanted to make sure that we deglazed the pan because the wonderful flavors that you get from the ribs, you don't want to waste any opportunity for flavor when you're cooking, so you can see. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay. I wanted to take a minute to show you this cool little thing. Caleb and I have fallen in love with it. This time is two weeks old. And um, it's been in the refrigerator. This is the cool little herb saver. It has a little water well down here. You put the water in, and then you just stick the stems of the, of the herb in there. And then you just, uh, hang on, let me see if I can. You just close it and keep it in the refrigerator. And it keeps the, am I on or off? OK. This is our herb saver. The time is about two weeks old, at least. It has a water well down there where you just put the thyme or the fresh herbs in, you close it, keep it in your refrigerator, and you have fresh herbs whenever you're ready. So I was like, wow, the thyme still looks good. I checked on it yesterday. Okay. So, um, great. And a, a bouquet garni is basically, that's like a, a fancy French term for a bunch of herbs. And normally, especially with beef, thyme goes really well, rosemary, bay leaf is excellent. So I normally just tie those together with a little piece of string or you can pop it in there with a, a little cheesecloth, a little bag. 
and I use that a lot as a flavouring. Obviously, we, we take that out, but it's just, it just presents wonderful flavour within the dish. I don't know if I have any string. Can we just, uh, what should we do? Yeah, we, we do have a little uh, bag for the, for the tea, you know, the little bag that you put yes. tea in. Hold yes, on. yes. Yes, I learned from my good friend Pam Downs, who uh, has inspired me about tea and uh, these little bags that, that, have that she has that you can, <laughs> you can put uh, herbs in them, the little tea bags that, 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 you, that you used to, to sell in tea and traditions. So I often put that together when, with the, when I'm making these dishes as well and just tie it in, in those little versatile bags. And obviously the, the, the bay leaf is, is wonderful. Sue has everything. Sometimes when you go to the, the supermarkets and that I had Wendy when I first moved to America and you see these spices that have maybe been on the rack for two years or something and you think, wow, you know, this doesn't seem very fresh. But I've cooked with a lot of this. Sue gave me some ginger and she actually gave me some thyme because I had a really sore throat and I put the, the thyme in the tea. I'm not sure if, if Pam probably knows about, about that from, did you ever try the thyme in the tea? That so you did that for a sore throat, and it was it was miraculous. It really made made the uh, so this is the the time that we're using. So it obviously has has really incredible properties. So if you've got a sore throat, come and get some of the the time from Sue, and you'll be amazed. We'll we'll just pop the bay leaves in because right. they don't. Yeah. Dental so floss. Don't leave home without <laughs> dental floss. <laughs> yes, dental floss has a lot of. Purposes. I was working in a restaurant last week, uh, and uh, Sharon was with me as well, and we were trying to cut the goat's cheese, and it was all falling apart. So one of the chefs said, "Oh, I know," and he went to I think it was one of the bags of carrots, the vegetables in the fr refrigerator. So we pulled it off, and we kind of cut the, the cheese. And he said, "Dental floss works as well." So, so it's amazing uh, how versatile uh, the, the dental floss can be. So, so that that's really. That's really it because the ribs are well seasoned and uh, we have with everything everything put together. So we'll go ahead and Sue's okay. going to. So now this is our Fistler pressure cooker. This is what I took over to Judas and said we can so do this. We can so do this in less than four hours. And you know some of you may have a big crop that you want to stick in your oven, go to church, come home and have it ready. That's great. But the pressure cooker is fabulous for this, and we actually cook these 45 minutes. Um, the day at her house. We've got a little more in here today, so we'll probably mm -hmm. go 50 minutes. But all you do with the Fistler pressure cooker is just make sure the blue lever on the handle is forward. That's the unlock position where you can put the lid on and off. And um, you're just going to match up the little circle here on the lid with the orange dot on the handle. Lock the lid into place. Be sure you push the blue lever back. That locks the, um, the lid on, you cannot open it now, and that allows the um, pressure to build inside the pot. I don't know how anyone lives without a pressure cooker now. Now mm. that I've learned how to cook in a pressure cooker, everything is in a mm. pressure cooker. Mm. The only thing I don't cook in a pressure cooker is oatmeal and mm. grits and spinach and fish and bread. Well, mm. I've even cooked bread in a pressure cooker. <laughs> so um, I was tempted to try the toffee pudding in the pressure cooker, and it's coming. It's coming. Okay, because you can so put ramekins and bread pudding and things like that inside a pressure cooker and use it like an oven. Yes, it's on. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe not. I keep turning it off when I step away. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it on now that I'm not running around. Sorry. So um, that's the, the pressure cooker. Um, I particularly love the Fissler pressure cookers. They're, they're made in Germany. They're just just excellent quality pressure cookers. Things really do cook fast. Um, they're not like your grandmother's pressure cookers, though. We love our grandmas. Um, I don't particularly like the ch -ch 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 that whole thing. Um, you will not explode these, so you're not going to find a chicken on your ceiling. I don't care how Lucy you are or Ethel you are, it's not going to happen. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of y'all saw the Lucy and Ethel show where they exploded the chicken on the, on the ceiling? Um, as the pressure builds, this little, um, this little uh, pressure valve is going to come up, and it will rise as the pressure builds. And when it gets to the second ring, that's the high pressure. Um, I'm bringing it up to pressure on high heat. And um, when it comes up to pressure, then mm -hmm. we'll just turn down the heat to medium, medium low somewhere. You'll, you'll have to kind of determine that. 
Um, however hot it, your burner needs to be to maintain that pressure, you just want to maintain it at that second ring, and then that's when we'll begin the timing. So um, we'll begin the time, like I said, when that comes up, and we'll do it. Uh, I find pressure cooking reduces the cooking time as much as one-fourth of the time, one-third the time, definitely one-half the time. Um, so you just have to gauge, you know, what you're cooking there. The mashed potatoes that we're going to do for you next, um, the potatoes will be ready in four minutes. So um, we're going to get those ready, mm -hmm. and then we'll get the counter cleared so that we can um, start doing some bread for you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Got those? Okay. So will, will I introduce the potatoes then, Sue? Yes. Well, we'll, we'll get them on the pressure, okay, in the pressure cooker. Super. Well, just let me introduce the potatoes to you. And I was watching Paula Dean last night, and she was talking about potatoes. She had different things. She said, she said I like to have butter and mayonnaise in my potatoes. She was saying, well, I, start, I agree with her, with, not so much with the mayonnaise, but I agree with her with the butter aspect, I have to, to admit. And obviously, I love uh, potatoes. And it is true, the Irish do eat a lot of potatoes. And, uh, but it's not all corned beef and cabbage, so I want to just get that myth out of the way. We, d we do have an extremely varied diet. In fact, we don't even eat corned beef in, at all in Ireland, which may surprise you. Uh, it was an American tradition that was brought over really? to New York and Boston from a Jewish tradition of brining the, the beef, and it was an economical cut that was available in New York and Boston at that time, and it was identified with the Irish community who ate that so it's an Irish American food so that's why in the book uh, the first I have coming to America the book is a culinary journey that starts in Ireland and then the middle is coming to America and the other half is called uh, is more southern and then it finishes with Irish southern fusion where I combine the two and the coming to America chapter I basically introduce foods that are classically in America considered Irish but they're actually not uh, but there are Irish American, which makes them very Irish, and uh, w because that that's such an, a wonderful identity here in the United States, and it needs to be celebrated because those people that came over here and uh, built those traditions, and it's still part of the Irish culture within the United States. And, and in Ireland, we love America, and uh, we feel such an affiliation with Ireland. So we're we're thrilled to be able to celebrate the Irish American corned beef recipe that is also featured in the book. Uh, but I do have some authenticity where I add the curly kale to it in with the potatoes. But this is another one of my uh, potato dishes. Maybe Sue will have me back to do the, uh, the corned beef and to oh, do a traditional yeah. St. Patrick's Day meal with the curly kale with oh, the potatoes, yeah. which is oh, yeah. traditional. I'll have to tell you a little story on mm. myself. I was born and raised in Savannah. Savannah, I don't know if you've been to Savannah? Oh, we love Savannah. Okay, because it's very Irish there. Mm -hmm. And always growing up, St. Patrick's Day was a holiday. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got out of school. And um, Savannah has one of the largest St. Patrick's Day parades in the country. I think we're second behind Chicago. And so that's the way I grew up. And um, so when I went to the University of Georgia to college, it came St. Patrick's Day. I'm like, what do you mean we're going to school? I literally, I was like, we, we don't have this day off. And people were like, for what? And I'm like, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and uh, though my family, they say they're not Irish, I still... I keep forgetting to turn my, sorry, um, I keep forgetting to turn my mic back on. I turn it <laughs> off when I walk away so y'all don't hear me clanging. But, um, but it was just so funny because people would go, you know, they didn't know what I was talking about. And uh, my family always told me we weren't Irish, but my last, my maiden name is Kennedy. <laughs> They say it's English. I don't know why they didn't want to claim <laughs> yeah. their Irish heritage. But my grandfather's name was Henry McGee. Oh, my goodness. Henry McGee Kennedy. Now, just Irish tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have some knights in our, yeah. in our uh, heritage, Clary. So oh. I, I'm thinking they're, they're, they're pulling a fast one yes. on me. So <laughs> definitely thinking. And now I married a strong German heritage, Beckers, yeah. Bacchus, Doss, what, or whatever their names are. So anyway. Well, when you said about that, I actually went to a lecture in Emory University that was talking about the, the Scots-Irish in the South. And they actually said the same thing, that a lot of the Scots-Irish didn't want, the, the Southerners didn't want to associate with their Irish heritage <laughs> because the Irish famine came over and they had nothing. They were, had so much poverty. And they, didn't, they, they felt that they were a little bit more sophisticated than these, these other Irish that were coming over. And uh, so that's why they, they decided, because they had money and they had land, 
and they'd establish roots wow. within the American side. So they thought, we're not going to admit that we're Irish. We're just American. So there was this kind of group, this culture where the heritage was not celebrated. While the Irish that came over to New York and Boston were going, they celebrated whether they were Italian or Irish or Polish. There was that celebration in Chicago, New York. But in the South, it, they became blended because they said, well, we, we, we've established, we're not going to associate ourselves with that. So there has been a little bit where I'm meeting people and that actually are Irish or Ulster Scots, but they don't really celebrate it. So, so I'm hoping to stir that up in the side yes. that if you're Ulster Scots or Irish, you can celebrate this because it's a wonderful heritage and it's time to claim it. And as well as obviously your proud American heritage, but there is so much uh, warmth and wealth uh, with being Irish. And, and I hope that, that this you know, continues to, to grow. Oh, yeah. So, so do you want to okay. mention the potatoes? So um, now we're going to do the potatoes. Again, um, the traditional way of doing mashed potatoes. Now, she calls them champs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or you say it so pretty. Say it. Champ. Champ. <laughs> champ. It's just so much prettier than champ, the way I said it. Um, but anyway, um, so we're going to do it in the pressure cooker. I love mashed potatoes in the pressure cooker because they're ready in four or five minutes. But here's the deal. How do you normally do potatoes for mashed potatoes? You put the, chop the potatoes, cover them with water, boil them to death, pour the water down the drain. So now you have waterlogged potatoes that now you've got to really flavor up to make them tasty. With the pressure cooker, we're just going to put a little bit of water down in the bottom because we must have some liquid in pressure cooker to build pressure and steam. Mm -hmm. And then we just, um, each pressure cooker comes with this little mm -hmm. trivet insert. Mm -hmm. So we just put that in there so that because the potatoes are kind of starchy, um, they'll tend to scorch if there's not a lot of water there. So we just lift them off mm -hmm. the bottom. So we're going to pour the potatoes in. Mm -hmm. Now, do you put other things in your potatoes when you're cooking them? Or no. did I just mess you up? Okay. No. All okay. right. Let me hold up. All right. So, yeah. We're just going to drop the potatoes in here. Let me hold up. Now, do you okay. want to put a little salt on them while they cook? Or? No. Okay. We'll, we'll put the salt into the, into okay. the cream. Yeah. All righty. So now we're just going to lock this lid into place. And this okay. is a six liter pressure cooker. This is the big guy. This is the 10 liter. They come in mm -hmm. all shapes and sizes. Um, this is one of our most popular sizes, the six liter. That was five pounds of potatoes. So you can see the six liter pot easily does five pounds of potatoes. Remember to lock your, um, your lever into, into the lock position. Just slide it back. And then just leave it on high. The pressure will begin to build. And once that pressure comes up to the second ring, We'll reduce the heat to medium, medium low, and then we'll cook these for four to five minutes, and they'll be ready to um, just let them naturally, we let the pressure naturally come down. They can just sit there, and that's what we were trying to decide the order, because it doesn't take that long for the potatoes, but pressure cooking cooks at a much higher temperature. That's how you're cooking faster. Every degree of pressure you raise and put in this pot, you raise the boiling point of water, so you're cooking hotter. So these potatoes, though, they may sit here for the next hour while we do the bread or whatever once they're done. They'll still be plenty hot to mash. And we'll just leave them sitting in the pot. They'll stay really hot. Then when we're ready to mash them, mm -hmm. we'll just finish them up. Mm -hmm. OK? So we'll let this come up. And I'll keep an eye okay. on this. And we'll make the wheaten bread and okay. get it in the oven. And just to, to tell you a little bit about potatoes, uh, because the Irish are experts in our potatoes, uh, we're using the, the red potatoes. And we really use that for more for potato salads, not for, for making the, the boiled potatoes. And uh, we're, we normally peel them as well in Ireland. But with Sue, is obviously we're lo looking at whole foods, so we're actually going to incorporate the skins because of the nutrition that's yes. in the skins. Mm -hmm. That's in the best part, part of that. So we're going to have a more whole kind of dish with that today. But just if you want to have mashed potatoes that have zero lumps in it, uh, you need to go for the Idaho potato in America, or else uh, the second best would be a Yukon gold potato. The reason is those potatoes, when you boil them with the steam, that they will disintegrate and they'll have zero lumps. Uh, the red potato is more a waxy potato, and it's perfect for a potato salad and for more German kind of type cooking dishes. But it's probably more nutritious, so that's probably why I see with the red skin, I'm sure that's the more healthy potato because color is always health. So we're here at the Bread Becker, so we're, we're with Whole Foods and, the, and this, is, this is gonna be delicious and it's gonna be the right potatoes for, for today. But just to, to let you know when you're shopping at the grocery store that different potatoes are gonna serve different purposes 
according to the dish that you want. Uh, another potato that I have in the book is the potato au gratin, which is one of my signature dishes as well. And for that, I normally, I like the Yukon Gold for that because mm -hmm. it's in between an Idaho and a red potato that it's still gonna hold its form, but it's gonna have that nice texture. So the Yukon Gold is probably my favorite potato uh, of all times to cook with. Uh, but, uh, and of course you could keep the skins on as well, like Sue does when you're making your potato gratin to make it more whole foods. Uh, but if you want a really nice creamy mashed potato, I find best results with the, the Idaho potatoes because they, they really just are fabulous for, for the mashed potatoes. And uh, just to tell you about the, the champ, or will, will I do the, will you do the bread and then we'll go back to finishing off the potatoes? Yeah, you want to do that? Okay, yeah. While they cook and we'll sure. get these things cooking yes, here. Yeah, we'll get that bread in the oven. Yep. So somebody, I met a lady this morning already and she said she was just back from Ireland over, over here or she went to Ireland and she was telling me the best thing in Ireland was the breads, isn't that correct? So that, that's what I hear a lot and people that move to England or move to America and uh, from Northern Ireland, they say, oh, I miss the bread. The bread's not the same. And for me, that was the same when I moved to America. I thought, the bread's not the same. And the big thing that I, uh, when you come from Europe to America, you notice is that most of the breads in the grocery stores, they're sweet. And we're not used to having sugar in our breads, but there seems to be, even with the pan loaves, there seems to be with the grocery store type bread. Uh, you know, it just doesn't taste like uh, bread in, in Europe at all. And unfortunately, there is a lot of the mass production in the United States with it being such a large country. Uh, but when you meet Sue Becker, she's obviously into grinding your own flour. It's like, yes, this actually tastes like bread is meant to be. So she came over and back to my kitchen. I thought, wow, this is like my grandmother's bread. And the, the, the wheat and bread recipe, if you, it's page 81 in the cookbook if you purchased a book. But I have added uh, wheat germ to that because I basically had to because when I made it with the American flour, I thought, this doesn't taste like enough fiber. It doesn't taste right. So I had to add the wheat germ, but with Sue's bread. Because if you if you look here, you'll see, see the brown in there? That's your wheat germ and your, and your bran. So you don't need to add that. So if you are, have a recipe at home or like I said in the book here, and you have a recipe that calls for flour and for wheat germ, just know that just combine the, the two amounts. Like here she says three cups of whole wheat flour and on down you'll see a half a cup of wheat germ. So we're just doing three and a half cups need of our mm -hmm. freshly milled mm -hmm. flour. You don't need wheat germ. It's, already, it's yeah, already in, in there. there. Yeah. Okay? So that's what we're doing there. So, um, so I've had to constantly substitute in the recipes. Oh, you know, what can I add? Add more oats, add more wheat germ to get that texture that I'm used to. But the Irish flour is obviously, it must be more freshly milled, even the stuff in the grocery store, but the stuff in the American grocery store, it seems to be so whiter than white, and it just, it sometimes, somehow they've just totally lost it. But I'm so th thankful that there's such a movement in the United States, the farm to table movement, where people, like the Whole Foods supermarkets, know that somebody volunteers, I work a lot in Whole Foods supermarkets, and it's all about bringing the, the local, you know, supporting that, bringing uh, from the farm fresh, there's farmers markets springing up all over the country and I think in America where people are saying we've had enough of this, we're not, we're not going to take this anymore and there is a movement that, that is happening which is really exciting with food, it's like a food revolution and uh, you know obviously Sue, is, is, Sue was ahead of her time because she was, <laughs> she was at Sue, this is the right um, amount I didn't, already. I didn't okay. mill quite enough so I'm going to okay. mill just a little okay. bit more, just okay. pardon me but this is the grain mill, I'm going to mill some more. And so, so is, is this one and a quarter cups mm -hmm. then? This yep. is ready to go. So these are the oats. That's two. And this is? That's the soft, the, oh, the, the, the soft, yeah. the soft mm -hmm. white, white flour here. Okay. And do we have oh. the, the buttermilk and the egg? Is this yes. here? Mm -hmm. I just think your this. soda is measured. So that was okay. two cups. This needs Let's take this over here. Three. So what we did here for the whole wheat, we just did the um, three and a half cups of the red. We're using the red wheat for the flavor. And then for the five ounces of regular flour, we did use soft wheat there. Because this is not a yeast bread, we can use the soft wheat. But we're using the nice hearty red wheat for that flavor. Okay. Caleb to open this. Uh, Caleb to maybe open that. Sir. <laughs> Let's see. 
Uh, yeah, Caleb. <laughs> so of course, the, in, in Ireland, we, for the raising agent, we, we tend to use the buttermilk and baking soda as our natural raising agent. So this is the, the correct amount of soda. Yeah, three tablespoons. Yes. Okay. And then a little bit of salt. So we just add some of this, this wonderful salt here. And let me go ahead and just cut this butter up a little bit. I'll rub this butter. Okay. And in, in Ireland, there's a tradition where we don't really use a lot of, of yeast in our bread. And it's almost kind of a lot of the Irish are almost, they're almost kind of anti yeast bread, which is, it's kind of a weird kind of phenomenon. But they, I know my grandmother, she ran a bed and breakfast all her life in, in Ireland. And uh, she, she got up early in the morning and made the, the fresh breads every morning, the wheaten bread that I'm making now, and also the, the soda. And it's really what we call in America a quick bread because you can make it really fast and literally within the space, you can make it in under 10 minutes and have it baking in, in a hot oven and it can be ready in a very, very short space of time uh, with, with very little work. And so I think that my grandmother, she almost kind of resented with the yeast bread, with the time rising and there was like a negativity with, with yeast bread that's kind of like a cultural thing that, that we don't really embrace yeast. So that's why I want to, to go to Sue's classes <laughs> to learn about yeast bread because I think I have a, a chip in my shoulder with, with yeast bread because we've just been, this has really been our native bread, that the, the wheat and bread bread that we're really obsessed with and we just, we, we really love. And the, the, the soda bread as well is uh, delicious with I add curry powder to that when I'm making an Indian style dish that is fabulous. Or you can add uh, fresh herbs, you can the curry gold cheese is wonderful. It's so versatile that you can incorporate what, uh, the various flavors to that. So, Well, and that's where the, the Southern tradition goes right along with that. I'm very Southern. My mother was born and raised in Georgia. Never has my mother made yeast bread, not a single day in her life. She, and she's a cook. Um, she worked her way through college making biscuits. And her mother worked her way through college making biscuits in the college cafeteria. So my mother has never made yeast bread to this day, thinks that she can't, mm -hmm. thinks there's something mythical or very difficult about it. But she can whip up a pan of biscuits and cornbread and quick breads. And, that, and so that's funny that your southern, yeah. your Irish heritage kind of goes along the same way. The reason for that is the kind of wheat that grows in the south, and obviously maybe Ireland where it's wetter, is a soft wheat. And you couldn't make yeast bread with mm -hmm. it. So you adapted mm -hmm. to what grew uh, in your area. And that's why Southerners are known for biscuits, cornbread, mm -hmm. cakes, and cookies, mm -hmm. and you know grandma's cakes. <laughs> um, so that was okay. it. Now for the, um, for the buttermilk, you, could, you can certainly use buttermilk, but I just wanted to tell you what I'm using here, something I've discovered, or, and Caleb and I have been just having a blast with it. This is homemade kefir. Um, it is so easy to make. We sell the kefir starters. The kefir organisms actually can recolonize your gut, so it's very healthy for you to have on hand. My breakfast this morning was a kefir smoothie as mm -hmm. I drove in to prepare for the class today. It's just so wonderful. Yogurt does some great things in your body with enzymes and B vitamins, but I, sent, I recently learned that yogurt organisms cannot recolonize your gut. It's good when you eat it, and it's good to eat the yogurt, but you have to eat the yogurt to get the, the benefits of the bacteria, whereas your kefir organisms, you can actually recolonize. They will reproduce in your gut. So um, I have this on hand all the time, and one morning I was making muffins and I didn't have buttermilk. And um, I used the kefir, oh my goodness, they were the fluffiest muffins I have ever had. And um, they were just wonderful. And I thought, why should I ever buy buttermilk again? The kefir starter, you just sprinkle it in, what we sell it, you sprinkle it into a quart of cold milk, you don't have to warm it up, cold milk, leave it on your counter. You don't need an incubator. And it cultures overnight. And then you take a few tablespoons of that and culture your next quart of milk before you put it in the refrigerator so you've mm -hmm. constantly got kefir going. Or you can use a half a cup to culture um, a half a gallon. So it's cheap and sometimes mm -hmm. um, buttermilk is not always available. If you want to go That's ahead it. and measure that, I'll okay. deal with this. Our pressure That's cooker's great. up, 
see it steaming and see it's up the second um, white ring here. So I'm just going to turn the, pre the heat down. I'm going to, I know this burner, so I'm going to turn it down to about four, three, and just let that pressure, uh, the heat stay to just maintain that pressure. This is a safety mechanism. It's a little over pressure, so it's releasing some steam and some pressure. Soon as the heat goes down a little bit, you'll see that'll all stop and this cooker will cook silently. None of that jiggling of the, of the pressure bobber. Um, our short ribs are almost up to pressure. So I can begin to turn the heat down there for it as soon as it comes on up. So it's as simple as just adding the, the buttermilk to it. The buttermilk reacts with the baking soda and that's what causes the bread to rise. And uh, to me it's always you know, a miraculous combination how, how these come together. And it's, it's obviously it's so fast. So I've got three cups of, of the kefir, which is, is absolutely really wonderful. And it's a really good probiotic as well. And uh, my husband had been on a lot of antibiotics and so he had recommended that he drink the kefir with the probiotic and that was huge. He, he really did recover through eating a lot of Greek yogurt and drinking the, the, the kefir. So it really does, it really does help. Okay, just so you can see, our um, short ribs are up. So I'm going to um, reduce the heat. I've got it to about level four. The high is nine, so I'm a little below halfway. The wonderful thing about these burners that we're using is um, they also have a timer. So I'm going to set the timer for 45 minutes, and this will just turn itself off then. Okay, and our potatoes, I forgot to set the timer, so I'm going to set the timer for them for four minutes. Yep, and I've got your so pants. So bread, we can, either, we can either just roll it out the same way that soda bread is, and, uh, um, but in fact, I, I normally out a little bit, see if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just yep. before I put it in. You want a little I flour? flour down there. I need quite a bit of flour for it. It's, it's quite a wet mixture. And here's a little more if you need it. Okay. Hang on just a minute, Judith. We're going to, I don't know how it goes. I don't know how it goes either. It's a blind leading the blind here. There we go. Bunny, yeah. All right. Okay. Now you should be better. Okay. So we basically take, and they said that overneeding is is uh, is basically worse than, uh, but no kneading is better than overneeding. I think that's the thing. Yeah. So you need to be careful because you want you don't just like the biscuits, the, the the southern biscuits. You want them to be nice and fluffy. So it's the same with these pans. So you want to, we do want to knead it though just a little bit, but. We don't want to go crazy with it, so that's that's really that's really all that we need. So we just shape it like this. And my my father-in-law actually makes three loaves. See if, if there's a, a third yeah, loaf. Yeah, there is. And my, my father-in-law was a baker all his life. From he was 14 years old, he started to work in a bakery, and he retired at 65. So he, this is actually his his rest. He worked with me. For, to make this bread in the cookbook and his hands are in the bakery chapter that my father-in-law is baking, uh, showing me how he, he can knead these two at one time. He just rolls them out so fast that it, 
I'm not quite as fast as him, but he had a lifetime with it. So, so that goes in like that. And then the third one will just, again, just knead it just, just a little bit. That's probably just it's going to be enough, slightly. Pat that in, form, form it. Okay. Just shape it in the loaf pan. And then we, then we get a knife or just the little cutter that we that you use. I love these. These knives are amazing. I've never worked with them before, but they're they're phenomenal. So they're I've got like a plastic handle. So just just basically cut cut this down in the middle to, to let, give air right down the center of the bread. And this goes in a really really hot oven, like 400 degrees, 4, 4, 425 or 430, not nice and hot. Let me see what would I recommend. Yeah, four twenty-five. Okay, somebody turn my okay. Oven off. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the the thing with the, the Irish quick breads is that uh, they do have to you do you have to have a really time. super duper Enjoy. hot oven, just like the the southern biscuits when you're cooking them. You want to have a real hot oven when you're making biscuits, scones, any of the quick breads. They don't need a lot of time, but but that's very important that you get the, the temperature right. And of course, the, you know, talking about the Southern connection, that's what I bring apart, apart in the book, is that so much of Southern culture was influenced by the Irish culture. For example, the, the biscuits are really made just like the scones that we make in Ireland. I thought, when I went into Ireland, I thought, what do you call these? These are biscuits. I said, what? We call those scones, you know? So it just seemed very, very similar because my family, you know, that, that they noticed the similarities. And obviously the cornbread, which I have in the coming to America, I talk about that is made in exactly the same way as the soda bread that would have been made. And, you know, I can't say for sure, but I would imagine that the early settlers, the Scots-Irish that came over to the south, that they, they basically used what they had because corn meal would have been readily available. So, and they obviously had the skillets, had the same method as what they had with the soda. And so they would have made those things by the open griddle in the same way as they made it in Ireland and transferred that over. So that's what, that's what I kind of noticed with Southern comfort food is uh, that there was such a, there was so much influence from Ireland. And I thought, well, nobody's ever brought this about. And that's what I felt that I wanted to celebrate the Southern Irish culture within the Southern food culture. Because for me, it was natural. I could really see it. And uh, so that's why I, one of my visions for writing the book, because uh, I love the South, I love Southern hospitality and fusing the Irish and Southern together. It seemed a very natural fit, both with the food and the sense of hospitality and warmth that is available in the South. So I'll go and finish off the potato the, the potato dish to talk, talk um, about that. No, I think we were gonna do the sticky toffee, toffee pudding. pudding. No yeah. problem, we'll get yeah. those in the yes. oven. Okay. The, I had that oven preheating, so we'll just okay. kick it on up to no 400. I know another, when people go to Ireland, uh, there's a few things that I always say as a, as a cook. I get emails all the time on my website, and they say uh, the, the highlight of my trip in Ireland was the sticky toffee pudding. So that was just such an incredible recipe. And it's one of my favorites as well, because it's, to me, it's the ultimate comfort food. It's lovely soft, and, and then the, the caramel sauce is, is amazing. And I love to serve it with either vanilla ice cream or with the, the fresh whipped cream. And, it's, it's really, it's one of my favorite desserts. And Sue had me, I came over last week and Sue had a sample for me. She said, what do you think? And I thought, oh my goodness, this was better than what I've ever tasted in, in Ireland because she just nailed it to, to an even higher level because of the incredible flour and the freshness of the ingredients. Yep. So that recipe is on page 51. If y'all want to turn there. It's really not that difficult. It does have a couple of little steps here. So, um, and one thing I did that I wanted to show Judith, and you're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna yeah. fall in okay, love with yeah. it when you see it. Hang on, just takes me. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one. I think that one's done. Anyway. done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is she has in the recipe book. Mm -hmm. In the recipe book, it has you cook it in um, ramekins, and I didn't have any here at the warehouse. 
So I got to looking at it, and you, you turn it out of the ramekin and then pour the sauce over it and serve it with whipped cream. So I actually made it in the little crown muffin pans and didn't fill it all the way up, and they rose up very nicely. And when I turned them out, they actually looked like little bells mm -hmm. and, to, and served them upside down. So we're going to mm. do that for you today. You're going to love it. I love my USA pans, the silicone-coated mm. pans, nonstick. You don't have to spray them. There's hardly any cleaning when you're done. Maybe a little bit with this um, recipe because it's a little... Um, softer than a muffin. It's a little stickier than a muffin, but you're going to absolutely love this. The sauce is amazing. You're going to want to eat it just <laughs> out of the pot. And then we're going to top it with um, a coffee flavored whipped cream. And it's just very rich, very delicious. Uh, the little bell is just enough. You, you cannot overeat this dish. And I was so excited that she gave me the <laughs> thumbs up because I substituted, you can see in the recipe there, um, the substitution list there, I substituted the soft white wheat. Um, it calls for self-rising flour. All self-rising flour is, is flour that has the baking powder, salt, and soda already added. So, um, and, the, and your wiser choice substitution there, it tells you um, how to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have that. Hmm. Is the bread ready, Susan? I'm going to go ahead and um, no, it I've got this okay, oven okay. heating. Let me, let me see. It's not quite there okay, yet. Sure. These take forever okay. to heat. So, um, yeah. Now, this is just flour. It doesn't have the salt and baking powder and stuff in it yet. Okay. All right. Let me see. Okay. And this is the... Um, the cup and a half? Is that what this is? Oh, no. This is three cups. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to puree our dates mm -hmm. with the baking soda and the hot coffee. Let's carry so, this over. Yeah, let me, I'll tell you what, let's put this back. Okay, yeah. Just a little, okay. to lift the lid. There's our dates. Um, we we chopped, we seeded mm -hmm. them and chopped them. I also want to call your attention to these dates. These, um, we just now, brand new, we have a whole line of um, trail mix and dried fruits. They're unsulfured and they're all organic. They are fabulous. These are the best dates you have ever tasted, that I've ever tasted. The dates you buy in the store are hard. They're already sugared. They're really not pleasant. Dates are extremely high in potassium. They're very high in fiber. They're a wonderful snack. This will cure your sweet tooth. Just one little date. And um, I think you're going to love uh, just having these around. Just if you have a little, mm, I want something sweet, then eat a date. And um, they're just nice and soft mm -hmm. and just absolutely delicious. Yep, there's a little trick to this one. Okay. All right. Yep, oh, I think you did it. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So we're going to puree our dates here. Did we put the soda in? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's see. Okay. All right, so there's our date puree. Mm -hmm. And um, Caleb and I, my son Caleb and I, are actually working on um, using date puree to sweeten granola and things like that. It will add the sweetness mm. without any mm -hmm. other sweetener and um, give you the fiber and the, the high potassium. So there's mm. our date puree. So we'll just set it aside for just a minute while we get the rest of this mm -hmm. mixture mixed up. I know my, my, this is my grandmother's recipe, but she actually didn't puree the dates. She just put the dates straight in. But my, my friend, who is a restaurant chef, he, he basically helped me tweak the recipe because with the puree, which is uh, it's, it's definitely more, a little bit more upscale and more delicious to puree the dates. I, I, I prefer it. But uh, in the UK and Ireland, most farmhouse cooking, they, they wouldn't puree the dates. They would just chop the dates and just put it straight in there. Uh, okay. into the recipe. Okay, so this is our kitchen assistant mixer. And all we're going to do is cream the butter. Okay, let's see, I need a... Uh, there we go. This will work. Okay. We're going to put the butter in and cream it. Oops, there's a little, little paper on that one. And then instead of brown sugar, I use the Sucanot, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So we're just going to cream the butter and sugar there. And then we'll add the eggs. Okay. Do you want me to crack yep, these in Yeah, you can crack here? them in and add those while I get this. And so this is my soft wheat flour, and I'm just going to add my baking powder, my salt and soda to it, and, um, and then that will make my self-rising flour. So it really doesn't have a lot of butter in it, so you sure it doesn't be, it's, it doesn't really have, it's not overly um, fat, fattening compared to a lot of cakes, it's not right, as sweet, six it's not as butter, sweet did as, you double it? You double it. I just, I'm yeah, not sure. it doesn't if, seem, does it seem, seem like, like enough. No, it yeah. doesn't. Did you double the butter there? I'm thinking you didn't. Yeah, yeah. okay, you know what? Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, it doesn't seem like. Yeah, I think yeah. this okay. is um, three ounces that okay. we melted for okay. the bread. And so, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. 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 Well, now it stays a little dry because yeah, there's not the yes. wetness yeah. when you get yeah. the eggs in there. Yeah. So that may have been enough because I think I measured the butter. Oh well, we're just gonna fine. have a little more butter. <laughs> maybe it was just drier with the um, the sugar. Maybe it just seemed more. Yes, it is. So, but once you add the eggs. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to just, you can put the eggs right in. Okay. Scrape that down a little. Just scrape that down a little bit more. Just to cream that a little bit more. Okay. Let me just scrape this one down. Okay. So we, we add the eggs one at a time, and I like to add a little bit of flour within it, with each addition of, of the egg. Oh yeah, that's just right. Just to, yeah. Just like when you're making a traditional Victoria sandwich cake. I love the kitchen assistant that you can add your ingredients while it's mixing. So now yeah. we add our vanilla. Okay, so. And our milk. Yeah. Go ahead and add the vanilla and the milk. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to just fold in the puree. So I'll just do you fold it in with the mixer, or do you? You can just mix it in. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't okay. need to. I thought it had to be gently. It'll all work. Okay. There we go. Okay. Where'd that? 
There's one in the sink. There you go. Okay. Okay. So that's our date puree. Okay. A little Let's more. See. You can also make this with brewed tea as well as coffee. You substitute that with the black tea. Sorry? You Black. can make it with tea instead, instead of coffee of, mm -hmm. if you want. Huh? Um, well, it's, I suppose it's just really the, the flavor, you know, the flavor of the dates, and that it just incorporates more, more flavor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think what you could. Yeah. What else could you substitute, Pam, instead of tea or coffee? Yeah. Sorry? What, rooibos? Yeah, the, the, the rooibos, yeah. Well, um, oh, no. Maybe... Um, no, no, that wouldn't work because it's a liquid. It has to, it would be too, add mu too much sweetness. And well, yeah, yeah, that would probably add some sweetness unless you just did some water mm. with a little molasses. Yeah. A molasses in there, a little half milk, half water with a little yeah. molasses. Because I know that that's a nice coffee flavored drink almost is the, mm -hmm. the molasses in, you know, like a tablespoon of molasses in hot water. Uh, I think you could, you, you probably could do yeah, that. Yeah, okay. You know, if you made it like a, like a coffee drink. The liquid, yeah. I think that would work. Okay. I think that the whole fun with, with food is having fun in the kitchen and you, you can do so much with it and it's whatever tastes good to you. So. You know, that, that, that's what, it's about playing in the kitchen as well and, and having fun and, and bringing that forth to your family so you can be creative and, and take risks. And if it doesn't turn out one time well, that's okay. You'll know not to make that mistake the second time round. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my uh, my brother-in-law was telling me he and my mother-in-law made some muffins and they picked up the wrong grain and they made them out of oat flour. And um, they made them just the regular recipe and he said they came out and they were just kind of like really dense and very moist and kind of wet and he said so we we cubed them up in um and then put them back in the oven and toasted them and let them dry out and he said then we ate it like cold cereal the little cubes with milk <laughs> over it and he said it was delicious we've had a great time eating it so um let me just okay. scoop this away okay. and i was going to use the, okay. the scoop there So here's how I did the little toffee, the little toffee bells. Mm -hmm. You can, of course, use a ramekin. These were a little smaller than your ramekin, but like I said, I thought that they rose up and they looked like little bells, and this was plenty big enough for a serving. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the recipe book with the ramekins, it does 10. Um, I found that one recipe did 18 muffins. So... Um, I'm gonna just. Um, Has that been greased then? So no, it doesn't do, need doesn't to. Need the silicone well, coated does not need wonderful. to be oiled. Um, Sharon, will you give me a head count? I want to make sure I do enough for everybody to have a whole one. We don't want to. <laughs> the voice from the deep. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Because I'm gonna make. Um, so see, will I start to do this, or we do this at the end? Do we melt this? Yeah, we'll do that. Just, at the very yeah, end. We'll, yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, you know what, Caleb? I am going to have to. Uh, this is such a good winter comfort food because in, oh. in the winter you want those nice cakes and sauces and hearty one-pot meals. And it's uh, and the wonderful thing is I know my boys normally don't eat dates, but they just love this pudding. And I didn't tell them that there were dates in it. Mm -mm. And, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't know. And then... I told them, I think, uh, after about eating it for two years, I said, you know, guys, there's dates in it. I said, what? You know, so, but they already knew it was one of their favorite desserts, so they weren't going to, because normally they, they wouldn't enjoy the taste of dates. But they are, they're absolutely fabulous flavor. And then, of course, with the, the sticky toffee sauce is, is amazing. 
Yeah. And, uh, I'm, so I've got a little bowl <laughs> over here that was left over, and I just kind of <laughs> kept me a little taste every now and then. And of course, in Ireland, sometimes we incorporate a little bit of bush mills into the whiskey, into the sticky toffee sauce, but I didn't want to add more alcohol to my book because I thought uh, <laughs> I, I, need, I need to get this under control because uh, I've incorporated some of the, the alcohol in the cooking of some of my books. So uh, I didn't want the Ireland, as we do have so many uh, beers and uh, whiskey production and that is, that is obviously famous throughout the world so we do use a lot of the things that, they, that we have to flavor and to braise pans and, and for cooking and, uh, and for our sauces. I'll actually do one pan. I only have two of the okay. crown and I don't know why I was thinking I had 36 but I'm going to do one, well, go ahead and one pan. And get these in. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do a pan of the in the little mini so too. So can I go ahead and get these um, two yes, going? Yes, that's the oven for that. Okay. And so uh, you could also, and I, they're so rich, I think you could easily do it in a little mini um, muffin pan too. So we'll just do the rest of this batter. So those of you that get a mini, we might have to give you two. And of course, moving to the south, uh, my friend from North Georgia, she invited me over to a family reunion and I couldn't get over the, the food that people brought, a pie from someone or fry, fried chicken, a potato dish from an aunt or a grandma. But I couldn't get over the array of desserts. They were just amazing. And in Northern Ireland, we're all about the desserts as well. And I'm used to the church gatherings where the desserts come out and they're just amazing. And, and they're always, there's certain things like the, whether it be pineapple delights, which are a big thing in Ireland, or the... The, the certain things that people bring and we always go, oh, is that so-and-so's, you know, desserts? And in the South, it's exactly the same. People make their, I love the chocolate meringue pies and the sweet potato pies and all the, the different desserts that you have. And I know that there's that excitement about desserts that, that oh, is yeah. celebrated in the South. And I talk about that in the chapter about the Southern Sweet, where I have an entire chapter that is devoted to Southern desserts. Uh, but I also incorporate an Irish twist uh, with many of those desserts. But um, learning about the history of the site, I think with the sugar plantations being in the site, that the sweets were something that was that was celebrated. And uh, but obviously we don't need to, to eat uh, quite as much sugar as maybe traditionally celebrated in the site. And Sue's able to to help us uh, make those desserts healthy and th those things so that we can enjoy a nice pudding and a dessert and uh, to incorporate those flavours. And this is certainly one of, of my favourites. And when you taste them, you'll you, they will, in fact, they taste better than what they, what they, they normally do, so uh, even with the healthy alternatives. And what's life without a little bit dessert, of dessert? There you go. <laughs> I know my, my grandmother used to always used to say, well, let's cheer ourselves up and go and get something sweet, you know, so she always had that mentality that you have a little bit of sugar when you're down is going to... To, to give you that lift, so. <laughs> so you'll pop these in here Okay. Mm -hmm. And we need to get, did we get the bread in? Okay, okay good deal. Yeah. Good, good, good. All righty we'll, then. We'll talk about the, the potatoes then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. It just went in, so we'll be ready for thir 35 minutes. Okay. And that little, that little chopping board thing. So let me tell you a bit about the about the potatoes, because as I say, uh, we're all about the potatoes in Ireland, and the potatoes are always freshly dug from the farm. And if you do go to Ireland, you'll find that the flavours of the potatoes are just incredible, and they do just melt in your mouth. And you'll understand why we like so many potatoes when you go to Ireland because the, the quality of them and the freshness of them freshly dug from the farm is going to make all the difference. And in fact, if you all would like to come and taste the potatoes in Ireland, I'm leading a culinary tour next June to Northern Ireland from June 4 to 11. It's going to be a seven day trip and it's going to uh, incorporate, we're partnering with some culinary schools in Ireland. So we're going to get to learn and to eat really good food, but it's not all going to be cooking. We're also going to see some of the major sites like the Giants Causeway and stay in great hotels and do wonderful sightseeing. So if uh, the link is on my website, and uh, my website is actually at the back of the, the cookbook if you, if you purchased a copy. Uh, but if you click on my website, you'll see a link 
with specialized tours in New York and you can have a look at the schedule. So if you get excited about Ireland through this class, I'd love to see you in our first ever culinary tour. My husband and I are really excited. So we're, we're kind of, ha we just need 20 people to sign up and we're about halfway there. So maybe I'll get the other 10 this morning signing up to come to Ireland. And I'd love you all to, to be there. So let, let me talk to you about the, the potatoes. The Irish champ potatoes, uh, which is in page, I'm not sure what page it is. 28. Page 28. And it's, it's probably one of the most famous dish of Ireland. That and Colcannon is our other famous dish. And as Sue has me back, maybe we could do a St. Patrick's Day meal in which I incorporate the curly kale and the Dubliner Irish cheese as well within to the potato dish, which is, is fabulous. Especially with, uh, I love to do it with boiled ham, which is probably more traditional than the corned beef, but the corned beef is fabulous with the curly kale. It all works really, really well. And I have that St. Patrick's Day dish uh, also featured in the cookbook. But th this is really, uh, the spring onions is what we love to use a lot in Ireland. And I know my, one of my best friends is Chinese, and the Chinese as a culture eat a lot of spring onions. And the Irish, we're crazy about spring onions as well. So I think that was one of the reasons why I enjoy Chinese food, because it, it reminds me so much of, of eating spring onions, because we, we incorporate that flavor of the onions into our potatoes. That's our classic dish. So I already, I've already chopped some of them, but we're, I'm just going to go ahead and chop that, that pretty finely. And you've got a choice. You can either, traditionally, we normally just put the, the spring onions into into the dish and we don't puree it but again uh, working in restaurants they tend to puree everything and strain everything which is um, more what, what my experience has been with food uh, but in, in country Irish cooking we normally just uh, just chop the the spring onions in there so the the fun thing about pureeing the the spring onions is that it gives the potatoes uh, a green they look green which is really fun for St. Patrick's Day, especially if you want to have, I know sometimes I've had a St. Patrick's Day party where everybody had to wear green, plus all the food was green. So I had fun creating menus where I have done that in the past. And the green potatoes, it's a natural way without using disgusting food dye that you can actually you know, play with green and, and have a flavor that that's gonna be good for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the power on here. Oh, you know what, we unplugged. Okay. And, uh, Regarding the, what goes in here, it uh, it's, it's may not be the most healthy, but it, it's going to taste good. It's, it's butter and, oh, and okay. heavy whipping cream. That's okay. But uh, you know, every, every now and again, it's going to be okay. But if you want to, I know that uh, my family, uh, my mother obviously watches the, the fat that she does. She never uses heavy whipping cream. She just uses uh, like 2% milk for this so that you can absolutely substitute that for 2% milk. You don't need to go for the, the heavy whipping cream. But it is, there, I always say there's, there's feast days and there's days to live normally. And I think sometimes for feasting, for those times, those celebration meals, where you get together with the family, sometimes you can splurge with a little bit of that extra butter and the heavy whipping cream. You don't want to be doing that every day, but it, it is wonderful and the flavor is outstanding. So I've, I've actually already uh, melted that a little bit earlier to get that going. So what we're going to do is we're going to infuse the, the spring onions with this when it melts. Yeah, and let's pull it over. Okay. Let you be doing it right here. I'll, here just, give, I'll just give, give that, a, that a little stir. Mm, and, and again, with, with infusing, you don't want to... Uh, it's not about overcooking your your vegetables and a lot of people say oh it's your Irish food is all about stodgy overcooked food and corned beef and cabbage and, and it's this terrible impression of what Irish food is all about but that's actually not what Irish food is all about we're really all about cooking uh, simple ingredients cooking them for the least amount of time as possible and uh, also having the slow cooked braised uh, meats, which you want to slow cook the, the braising your beef, that's important. But it comes to vegetables, minimum, you want to do that, the absolute least of that. So uh, as this melts, I'm just going to, I'm going to bring that to a boil. And then we just want to, to go ahead and the spring onions, I just want to heat them, that up to a point where 
you want to take the, the bite out of the, the spring onions so that it's not so overpowering, but you don't want to overtake it away so that you lose the, the wonderful vibrancy of the green color. So we're going to go ahead and just heat that and also we won't need to do it much because when we, we add it to the potatoes, it, it's going to kind of cook the onions a little bit as well. Okay. They will get the color without the flavor. And again, we can either puree this or else we can, we okay. can just serve it as it is. So, so it, e either way will, will, will work out, you know, you so it's stick, just two different. Uh, a stick blender? Yeah, okay, well, we'll go ahead and, and, and do that. So it is a little bit nicer when it is pureed. So this is the ultimate comfort food. In, in Ireland, my, uh, my husband, he's the youngest of five, and his father was the youngest of 11 children. And uh, for, when my grandfather said this was a staple meal for them, they would have had, this champ would have been the family meal. There was, would have been no meat at all. They just would have been the champ. But traditionally, this would be served in a big bowl in Ireland with a bit of butter in the center, sometimes with a white sauce. And I know that my father uh, used to talk about, you know, in time, when times were, were lean and they didn't have, you know, a lot of money, and they would just even would have had a, a raw egg would have been incorporated into the center as well of, the, of this here. So that would have been classic stories, but it, this would have been traditional. And of course, during the Irish famine, uh, the potato, the potato blight came to Ireland. The Irish were lost everything because they were so dependent on the potato. And, uh, you know, so, so that's kind of the, the sad history of the, the potato in Ireland. Uh, but it wouldn't have been, oats would have been a much older uh, grain that we would have had in Ireland that we had the, the oatmeal to start off with. And, uh, but the potatoes would have been something that would have come uh, later on. And even baking soda was only introduced in the 1800s to Ireland. So that's why I've talked about the oat cakes, the recipe is there and maybe that's something mm -hmm. I could make see so if it came oh, back yeah. again because the oat cakes would have been made on the griddle and uh, that, that's kind of the most ancient of Irish breads and it's an absolutely fantastic cracker bread and I serve it a lot with the Kerrygold cheese and apple chutney and butter for appetizers mm -hmm. but that would have been in fact I have a there's a scripture cross in there uh, with the oat cake recipe in the bakery section uh, from the cross of moon it's a 2000 year old cross but it has the miracle of the feeding of the 5000 and the irish had put that with the fish and the oat cakes because that was their version of bread when they thought about that and a lot of these crosses around ireland that's how the, the irish could not read or write uh 2000 years ago so that's why the the priests had to the the scripture crosses were made and they basically have got those images of scripture and the storytelling and the Irish, they would have gathered around these crosses and the, uh, the priest would have said, would have talked about these crosses and this is how the Irish, Native Irish had learnt scripture. So it's another thing that you won't find on the tourist trail, but if you do make it to Ireland, you should look uh, out for the scripture crosses that are hidden all over the countryside and go and take a look at them and see the way they have depicted the stories, the biblical stories through those crosses. Uh, because it, it's something my husband and I uh, love to do. It's kind of a little bit crazy, but we love to hike along fields and find these obscure crosses and, and uh, look at the way they have identified scripture. And you, you'll see one of those crosses, of the photography that my husband did all the photography for the cookbook. And he, he also put that photograph of the cross of moon there. So this is, this is done. This is just getting to the point where where it's boiling, so that's, that's just gonna be enough. We'll just do it for, for one minute. And those potatoes are, are almost are, are done, so that's, mm -hmm. that'll probably be it should be enough just to take the Okay, let me Yeah. So that's just to, enough to keep the colour without This pressure cooker is, is amazing how, how fast it does. I couldn't get over with the ribs because normally it takes me three hours to, to cook the ribs and you can just have a meal so fast. Okay. So those potatoes dry out as well. Mm -hmm. So they can yeah. or we can, um, we yeah. can lift them well, out and well, put them in well, another pot. Well, it's nice, it's just nice to see them and drying out. And another secret of potatoes, because I'm an expert with potatoes from Ireland, 
The most important thing about potatoes is the drying out of the potatoes. It's basically the steam that comes up and, and dries that. And I see that with the pressure cooker, that kind of automatically happens. But if you don't have a pressure cooker, when I cook my potatoes, I always uh, put them on a, on a colander and switch the heat on low and let them steam out because that's going to make them nice and fluffy and make the potatoes dry out, uh, which, is, which is obviously uh, going to be really important so you don't have a stodgy potato. They're pretty dry. Oh yeah, because, they're, they're beautiful. Because you don't you don't yeah. have all that water yeah. soaking in them. So. Yeah, that happens naturally anyway with the, the pressure cooker, but And if you want, to, if you have, if you want your your potatoes to be more green for a St. Patrick's Day party, just put more spring onions into it to get the, the vibrancy. And sometimes I blanch the spring onions. I cook them and blanch them, and then put them into a bowl of ice water to get that nice green vibrancy, and then puree that and add that to the potatoes. But the instructions are all exactly how to make that in the Green Champ recipe. So we're going to. To, to mash these then. Are we ready to mash them? Y yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And I'm going to add some salt and pepper to this because I didn't add any potato okay. into the potatoes. So, so go add a little bit of salt. This puree is ready. Okay. I know some, sometimes um, in restaurants we always use a, a potato ricer when you're doing potatoes, first of all, because that's going to get all your lumps out, and then after that you add the, the, the puree, that's going to ensure that. But with the whole skins on, this is going to. Here's what I use. Okay, <laughs> okay. I need to get Caleb some elbow grease in this here. Caleb, could you give us some elbow grease? <laughs> it all takes a man to do this kind of work. <laughs> I can see why the majority of men are chefs because it is physical, isn't it? Caleb, there's so much physical work with lifting out pans and, and mashing and all of this. It takes a lot of, lot of elbow grease to, to, to get it done. I know as, as a woman, when I work in kitchens, I, my back is always killing me because it, it's just so much physical physical labor. But it's always more pleasant with a woman. Than a <laughs> Even if it's your mom. That's, right. <laughs> That's a bit like Paula Dean and her sons. This is like Caleb and, uh, and Sue. <laughs> and I'm from Savannah. Hey. <laughs> Great, okay, yeah, thank you. I may have added probably too much liquid, so we'll see how we go. If we can leave this over for another day. I can finish this over there if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so are we, what, what, what's next on the, on the agenda? We're getting ready just to. I think we've done all yeah. the recipes yeah. that we're yeah. going to do, so yeah. we could do some questions. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I need to um, make the whipping me, cream and the sauce for the toffee pudding. And we're praying over the toffee pudding. I just realized I never put the salt in the flour. In case mm. you so we're going to pray for a miracle. <laughs> never put the what? Never put the salt in the flour. Oh. <laughs> so they're going to they're gonna be all right. We may salt them. Well, they look as if they're rising up yep. just perfectly. They look yes. beautiful. All right. right, let's. Um, we'll make the, the toffee sauce. Mm-hmm. Um, Let me get this out of the way.
Anybody have any questions? Okay, you have a question. Uh, can you use the coconut milk for the keeper starter? Yes, right? Yes, it's fabulous. It's, uh, it's, yes, it is our favorite, actually. Yes. Um, that's what's so uh, wonderful about the keeper starter. You can ferment anything with it. You can ferment tea. You can ferment um, juice. In fact, we had, um, we had leftover herbal tea, one, sweetened herbal tea. I don't remember which one it was. It might have been the cherry. The, the wild strawberry tea, herbal tea that we sell, and the cherry, the dewy cherry. We had them left over um, after a class one day, just after we had gotten the kefir starter. And he, he cultured the, the tea. It was sweetened and he cultured it. It tasted like um, some of the sodas that we sell. It tasted like a natural soda. Because the kefir does impart uh, carbonation, carbon dioxide, a tad bit of alcohol, but it's just, it's absolutely wonderful. And yes, you can do coconut milk, um, regular milk, whatever. And that's why I've, I've just decided I'm, there's no need for me to buy mm. buttermilk because it's so easy to make the, mm. the kefir and I have it on hand now all the time. So, um, and the, the other thing I'm so excited about is that uh, it will, you can culture anything with it, yeah. And that's nice for kids that have allergies. If you've got the milk allergies, you can still, and the juice, like I said, it is so delicious. They will think they're drinking a soda. It's not like, oh, this is, uh, you know, beer or wine. It doesn't taste like that. It's just naturally bubbly. And it's, oh, okay. Okay. Um, we're going to start over with what was in this pot because I didn't know I had turned on the burner here. So, um, let me just get. Are, they, are these done? Are these? Let the me check them. Print? Yeah. I think the bottom ones might be. Yeah. So you, if you want to answer questions, okay. I will okay. work on these, and I've got to redo mm -hmm. the sauce there because well, I just. Well, just out it. of interest, how many would identify more with the Scots Irish cults culture in this room, and then there's the Irish culture. But w w could you raise your hand if you feel that you identify more with the Scots Irish culture, as from Northern Ireland? So that's probably about half of, of the class. And then who would identify more with the native Irish culture? I know O'Leary. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, there's such a, a, such a combination that the Scots-Irish would have come, come over. They were all part of the same Celtic people group that came over. Uh, the, the Irish and the, and the Scottish are really the same Celtic people group anyway. So if you go back far enough, we're all kind of the, the, one, the one source. And, the, the, between Scotland and, and Ireland, the time of, of kilts and travelling, they would have went back and forth uh, years ago. And then if, if you go further back, we're all actually from the Viking descent. So uh, it's amazing the, the, cultural, the cultural differences uh, you know, between, between that. But uh, I grew up in Northern Ireland, and uh, thankfully, uh, and you may have heard a lot of bad stories about uh, Northern Ireland, but thankfully, I can say we're in, in a wonderful time of peace in Ireland and politically relationships have never been better between the UK and Ireland. And I've lived through uh, the worst of the troubles because they started, uh, I was born in 1970 and the troubles started in 1969. So I lived through, you know, all of the, the yucky stuff. And uh, it's just wonderful that I know my cousins uh, growing up in Ireland have no idea what we have to go through. Uh, with, uh, with what happened in Ireland and with the divisions, but thank goodness we have been able to, to work it out and uh, been able to, to move forward. And also the United States politically helped us so much and invested so much money regarding, especially Bill Clinton, even though you may, a lot of people don't seem to be very fond of him, but he did a wonderful thing for Northern Ireland uh, during the time he was president uh, because he sent uh, with uh, Senator Mitchell over from Maine, and he basically worked an incredible plan with reconciliation in Northern Ireland and uh, invested so much that really turned everything upside down and really resulted in, in us having you know, tremendous healing. And uh, so I have to say, I do thank President Clinton for that. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate what, what he has done and what uh, the, the relationships. So does anybody have any questions about the food or about uh, Ireland or about the culinary tour in Ireland coming up in June. Has anybody ever been to Northern Ireland? 
Wow, that's wonderful. Because a lot of people tend to go more to the, the south of Ireland. Uh, but Tourism Ireland, uh, I work a lot with Tourism Ireland. And during the time of the Anglo-Irish peace agreement in the 80s that was set up that resulted in peace in Ireland, they set up a board called Tourism Ireland that basically incorporates tourism for the entire island of Ireland. And so they, they work together to really promote Northern Ireland and have done a wonderful job. In fact, next year is going to be the anniversary of the Titanic. The Titanic sank 100 years ago. And uh, it's going to be, it went down um, in, in 1912, and this is 2012 coming up. So it's going to be a huge thing. And my grandfather, uh, he waved goodbye to the Titanic on his grandfather's shoulders. And being from, because it was built in Belfast, it's a very, we're very proud of it. Uh, even though uh, obviously it was a tragic story that happened. But the final recipe in the cookbook is actually a recipe from the Titanic. And I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, Titanic dinner parties next year uh, because of t uh, Tourism Ireland working with them. And we're going to be heavily promoting a lot of the, the recipes that were made in that fatal night in the Titanic. And uh, that recipe is the, the baked apple meringue, which is the, the final chapter. So. I'm going to be, be doing some YouTube videos and things and dinner parties uh, to sell to reenact scenes from the Titanic. But uh, they've actually built a big museum in Northern Ireland that cost over, I think it's 23 million British pounds. And they're launching that museum in Ireland next June. So it's going to be a huge, a huge celebration and investment uh, to celebrate uh, what, what, they, what they have done and built by the, the people in, in Belfast. And, of course, on our maiden voyage to America. So it links America and, and Ireland together and Northern Ireland together and uh, in, a way, in a way that uh, has so much history and so many stories. Does anybody have any, any questions at all? No? So I think we're, we're getting together a salad as well. We have a, mm -hmm. a salad at the end of the course, and it's one of my favorite salads. It's a, a blackberry vinaigrette. And uh, blackberry picking is something that uh, in Ireland they grow wild in the hedges. And so they're, they're always uh, delicious and very easy, especially around September time. I always have memories of, of gathering blackberries. And uh, the, the vinaigrette is basically the, the pureed mm -hmm. yep. uh, blackberries. And then we add the balsamic vinegar into that with the shallot. And then we are pairing that with blue cheese and also, Caleb did these incredible walnuts that he uh, it's that it's from that the book. From, it's yeah. on page um, mm -hmm. 147. Mm -hmm. The the spiced walnuts mm -hmm. they are fabulous. Mm -hmm. They are fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, very delicious. Right from the book, I'm mm -hmm. ready to do some. What a great gift! When you taste these, it it would make a great Christmas gift. They were so easy. I never knew about uh, putting them in egg white. Mm -hmm. tossing them in egg white mm -hmm. and then and take them out of the egg white and then toss them in your spices. It's just like the store-bought uh, candied nut. I mean, they don't have to be sweet. Mm -hmm. So that's on page 147. We just got to thinking with all the meat and potatoes and the bread, we needed something green. So mm -hmm. I just really <laughs> thought that that was beautiful. <laughs> and golden pears are so in right now. Um, it was a toss-up between this one and the, the citrus one because citrus is, is big, you know, at the holiday. So there's just some other great recipes here. But the spiced walnuts are right here um, in the book. I want to make the, um, the toffee pudding, uh, the toffee glaze or whatever. What do you call it? Sauce. <laughs> oh, I yeah. changed the Stick. book. Yeah, yeah, the sticky sauce. Yeah. Yeah. We need to make that. And then okay. we'll make the whipped cream okay. uh, to top the, the puddings with. We're going to pray over the puddings because I <laughs> realized I did not put the salt in the flour. I don't think I ever did. Um, they, I actually <laughs> tasted one, though, and it still tastes delicious. So, <laughs> miracle, miracle. <laughs> okay, good. The, that was the Irish soda bread from her cookbook. And then that was the in a jam. Let me walk right out here, and I'll go over a few of these things, and then we'll finish up here. Um, this was the in a jam dip mix. Uh, we sell all kinds of these dip mixes. I love them, love them, love them. There's no sugar. They're, actually, this one does have a little bit of, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. One of them has the, a little bit of brown sugar in it. I think it's the pumpkin one. Um, but this one is just ginger, onions, almonds, jalapeno pepper, and garlic. Sounds interesting. 
great combination. And the recipe is on the back. You just mix it with an eight ounce block of cream cheese and some type of jam or jelly. I love the orange marmalade. That's one of my favorite, or the apricot. Those are, those are two of my favorite, but you could do whatever flavor you want. It's a great spread for crackers, bagels, and I just thought it would be a nice, um, actually it was Caleb's idea. He said, what about the, the in a jam um, mm. for the, the soda bread? Mm. For the, um, I did use cream cheese. I did use cream cheese today. Um, I would certainly use the drained yogurt. Of course, just know it's going to give you a little bit of tartness there. Um, so you might need a little sweetener, a uh, little more sweetener, maybe a little honey or something uh, if you use the drained yogurt. But I did use cream cheese today. And then the herb butter that we're going to be serving with the wheat bread, the wheaten bread, is, um, did I put that recipe there? I think I might have. Yeah, I think I, yeah. Okay, yeah, what Caleb's saying, if you want to use the drained yogurt and you don't want that tartness, some places it's fine, then just add a little bit of salt and it'll kind of cut that, cut that down. But um, I, I can't tell you enough how much I love um, Judith's book. The pictures alone are beautiful. The oatmeal this morning was the steel-cut oats, the gluten-free steel-cut oats. We used those. The broth, of course, in the soup. I love the Imagine Broths. We're going to make the whipping cream for you now with the, um, for the sticky uh, pudding with the whipped cream maker. And um, I want to tell you, we, we found this line of spices in Baltimore at the Natural Products Expo. You just have to smell them to appreciate them or taste them. The herb butter, I've made it many, many times with the herbs that I have from the grocery store. No comparison. <laughs> the time that I gave mm. Judith to make some tea, I, I mean, you can just smell it. The ground mm. ginger smells like you just grated ginger. Um, there really is a difference in your spices. They're telling me that you should throw away your spices after six months. They're, there's nothing wrong with them, mm -hmm. but they've lost some of the volatile oil. Mm -hmm. So we chose to package them in a little smaller containers. Um, this is still much bigger than um, what you're going to get in the store. And it's, it's a great price for what you're getting. And I think you're just going to love the spices. I'll actually put out some of my open containers um, here for if you want to smell the thyme and the Italian seasoning and the ginger and the cinnamon are just like nothing you've ever experienced. And then I cannot tell you enough the dates. I'll, I'll um, in fact, maybe I'll go get some and sample them if you want to just taste the date. Mm. I'm not a big date fan. Um, I don't like dates. <laughs> I'll tell you a little joke on myself one time. You know, they're seasonal. They don't put them out. And um, so I went to, I was very pregnant with one of my children, and I was at Sam's. It was Christmas time, and I was looking for um, the dates, and I couldn't find them anywhere. Or it was actually before Christmas. They hadn't put them out yet. So I went up to this cute little young man that was stocking the shelves, and I said, excuse me, sir, do you have dates? And he just looked at me, and he goes, well, um, every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got so embarrassed and flustered. I was like, um, um, no. And then he just started laughing. I mean, I'm like, I mean the dates to eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, my, my children have teased me about, um, you know, hitting on the, the stock boy at Sam's, you know, mm -hmm. that I, but it was just funny. He got a little embarrassed. I got a little embarrassed. But anyway, these, I don't know why I told you that. But um, these are delicious dates, and um, they're great dates to have. So, um I just, I really think once you taste them, you'll experience the difference. All the, the trail mix, the dried fruits, um, the apricots, the pineapple, the mango, the nuts, they're all organic. Um, they, they have no, no sulfur dioxide, so the, the apricots are going to be brown. So they're not going to be the pretty orange that you're used to. You're going to go, oh, these are ugly, but they're delicious. Um, so that's what you have to tell yourself. <laughs> um, you know, some fruits, it doesn't matter. The pineapple is, is just amazing it's just all very very delicious i think you'll love love it love it and i'm thinking what a great gift basket if you wanted to send somebody why go to the store or go to these catalogs and buy these things you know that half of it you don't need and want you know pick and choose your own nuts and dried fruit and the trail mix and the dates and put it in a basket um, to send someone. That's what my mom's getting. So um, anyway, I guess I just told her if she watches. But um, anyway, so those are, I really want you to experience those spices. My spice friend uh, Sharon over there, when, when we did the fall class together, we had just gotten the spices in and 
uh, or actually, it was it was after the fall class because she was cracking up because some of my spices in the cabinet were like five years old. She was like, Sue, you really, <laughs> we need to get rid of these. And so then the next class we did together, we had just gotten these in, and she was just going wild. She was like, oh, my goodness, this is so wonderful. So anyway, okay, I'm going to need to measure my ingredients for the, the sticky toffee sauce because I talked and, and uh, burned that one. So anyway, we're just real here. It's all right. All right, so I need a, a cup and a quarter. Seven ounces of the brown sugar is about a cup and a quarter. I, measure, I weighed that for you. And then um, four and a half ounces of butter, a stick of butter is four ounces. So we'll just get a little bit more than a stick. I can't wait till y'all see these, these finished sticky puddings. They are so wonderful. What is sucanat? It's evaporated cane juice. It's the juice of the sugar cane um, cooked down, and then they evaporate the moisture off. So it's not crystallized. Um, and the molasses has not been removed. So it's very minimally processed. It is still a sugar cane product. Um, it's called sugar in some circles because the juice of the sugar cane that they make white sugar from is, is what they make this from. But it's just not, there's 13 um, steps of processing um, with white sugar, where they just remove, 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 bleach, crystallize until they get white sugar. Um, so will we take the, we can take, take that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, the pressure hasn't quite okay, come down. Okay, okay. You can, um, a nice thing when you're doing meat in the pressure cooker, I like to, if I have the time, is to let that pressure naturally release. That's mm. kind of a good resting mm. um, phase. It continues cooking a little bit. As long as that pressure's up, it's cooking. Mm -hmm. Okay, now y'all gonna get me going here again. I'm not burning another pot of this stuff. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to stir it? Yes, yeah. that would probably be yeah. fabulous. <laughs> um, does it have a little cream? Oh yeah, it needs a little cream. That's. Mm -hmm. That would help. See if I'd put the cream in there. There we go. Okay. Um, but anyway, so I like with my meats and things, I love to let them naturally release. Um, as long as that pressure's up, it is, it is actually continuing to cook, even if you sit it off the burner. But then letting it naturally release, those meats, that gives them a chance to just tenderize, to rest, to just not be be rubbery. And um, now vegetables like green beans that I pressure two and a half minutes. When that two and a half minutes is up for my raw green beans, I take them to the sink, run the, the edge of the pressure cooker under cold water because I don't want them to continue cooking. If they only need two and a half minutes to cook done, if you let that pressure come down for five minutes, they're going to be mush. So the delicate vegetables and things like that, you want to get that pressure down and that stops that cooking. But your potatoes and meats and things like that, it doesn't matter. And like I said, um, the temperature is so hot that the potatoes, it didn't matter that we did them early and then they can just sit there ready to be mashed. They were still plenty, too hot for me to even touch, though they had been sitting there um, all this time. So we're going to, um, another way to release the pressure is to just uh, press this lever forward, just push it forward, and that will release the, um, the pressure. Okay. Just put that right in the center there. So that's what your sucanat is. It's the evaporated cane juice. It's got all your molasses. Because, you know, brown sugar is no more nutritious than white sugar. Some people think that it is. And brown sugar now, it's, it used to be a few steps short of white sugar. Now it's just white sugar with a little caramel coloring and a little molasses added back. So, um, I mean, everything is, is for convenience. So... Um, so I just used the sucanat for brown sugar and then the sucanat with honey or the honey granules 
is what we used wherever it called for white sugar, and that's your honey granules. Mm. And it's the same, similar product. The juice of the sugar cane, they do take out the molasses, they add a, a sweet, mild honey, and then they evaporate the moisture off. It's not just honey. Some people, it's not dehydrated honey. There is a product out there that's um, uh, dehydrated honey, but this is called your honey granules. Uh, trademark name is Sucanaut. That's a particular um, brand name. So sometimes our honey granules will be called Sucanaut with honey. Sometimes it's honey granules. Just depends on what supplier um, we get it from. So that, that's your sweetener there. Well, while Judith is, is making the sauce here, I'll make the whipping cream. I can't wait for you to see how pretty this little tray of these um, toffee puddings are. When we get this all done, we're going to put them out on the tray here. But let me make the whipping cream in our wonderful whipped cream maker. I love, love this thing. Great Christmas gift. Great, great Christmas gift. And Sue also adds some coffee flavoring, which was so clever. Oh, yeah. I didn't add that in the cookbook, but it is delicious. Yes. It's a great idea to incorporate that flavor in the whipped cream. Our extracts that we carry are all organic. They are wonderful. Sauce is ready now. That ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can just turn that off okay. if you want. Okay, and then all we're going to do is pour, it'll hold two cups, which is a pint of whipping cream. It'll turn off and okay, it's instantly done. So. So the whipped cream maker will hold two pints of whipping cream. I'm going to give it just a little shot of sweetener. I'll use honey. Agave nectar will work here. Mm -hmm. About two tablespoons. Mm -hmm. And for this dish, it doesn't need to be very sweet because you've got this is going on top of these little sticky rolls. And then I used a teaspoon of the vanilla extract. And a teaspoon of the okay. coffee extract. Okay. Can we go ahead? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoops. I won't put quite all of it in there because I don't want it too. All right. And then I just give it a shake. Put my lid on. And I just give it a little shake just to just to get that honey because honey's so heavy. That's why agave works pretty nicely too because it's not quite as heavy and mixes in a little better. And then now I need my cartridge. And I hope that it's where it's supposed to be. Yes. Imagine that. It's not like mm -hmm. home. It's like, where is this? So you just put your cartridge. It's a, a nitrogen cartridge. You just put that here and twist it. It instantly pressurizes, oh. and it's ready. Wow, it's easy. <laughs> and it keeps for about two weeks. Whoa, wow. hello. <laughs> we'll do that. And we'll put the little, whoa, hello. <laughs> Never seen it do that. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. It's definitely pressurized. Hello. <laughs> I have never seen it do this before. I've never seen that happen. No. Okay, stop. Okay, why? Hello. Okay, we better hurry and serve oh, these. Oh, goodness, yeah. This is hilarious. I have never seen this oh, do wow. this. It's just going to come out. It's definitely pressurized. We'll put it into a bowl, will we? Yeah, something. Right out, yeah. Don't want to waste it. Well, so much for that little oh, it demonstration. Stopped. Oh, no. Did it stop? No, no. Okay, I think it's going to slow down there. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's um, get this on the burner here. I mean, on the hot plate. And we'll get rid of the burner so we can 
do our little sticky rolls. That was hilarious. I've never seen that happen. How many of y'all have those? I've never, I've never done that. In fact, usually I'm up there going, please come out. <laughs> and it always does, but I'm always, it, it's something you just think it's not going to work. Surely that can't be that simple. Okay. All right. Okay. Is that too hot? Okay. And I actually found that it was better. You let them sit on the counter uh, for just about five minutes to cool. Come on. See how they look like little bells? They look adorable. I have them in the in the book. I suggest you use ramekin dishes, but these are much. They much they just They're work, just and you have them, you know, on hand, probably. Oh, I probably need to. Some of these have stuck around the edge. Like I said, this this batter is a little more delicate than a muffin batter, and so if it's if it's gone over the edge, you wanna you wanna loosen that edge. That's what's making them stick. There we go. Give the pan a little bang. Yeah, just kind of loosen the edge there. But I'll show you what we're going to do with the sauce here. Okay, so there's our dish. going to drizzle with this with the toffee sauce probably could use a little bigger spoon here do you want to wait and do the cream at the, the very end yeah okay. oh you're going to love these mm -hmm. And I made enough for everybody to have their own. We're not cutting these. <laughs> I actually took a picture because I don't do pretty food. And I'm, I'm just so taken by people that do pretty food. That's probably why I love her book so much. It's just like, oh, this is so pretty. You'd be, you'd be actually proud of me. I actually garnished my potato soup last night with green onions. <laughs> Normally, it's like I put the pressure cooker on the table, and it's like, have at it. Dip it out of the pot, you know? And they're, they're helping me. They're helping to prettify me a little bit. So there's that. And then we'll just take the okay. whipped cream. And we'll do just make sure you hold the whipped cream maker straight up. And we're just, whoop. It's coming. Oh, that's not working. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's doing it again. <laughs> okay, I Aww. don't know what to do with this. But anyway, look at that one, how pretty it is. Aww. <laughs> Need to work lightning fast. This, this is like the I've never the had to do this. I, I, I don't know if it's the pressure outside or. There we go. No, it works. I'm just letting it kind of going by itself. Yeah. Okay. Oops. There we go. All right. Woohoo! Keeps on going. <laughs> I've I've never had it do that. Maybe I shook it too much from the beginning. And this then is definitely I a, went back. The chef's and, challenge. Yeah. I went back afterwards and drizzled just a little more sauce over, just the top of, of that. It's just going. Oops. Okay, well, we're going <laughs> to. The gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and this was the dish I was so excited about doing. I was like, y'all are going to be so impressed with how pretty pot I did. And now look.
<laughs> yes, it is. What would this class be without a Lucy moment? <laughs> Where's Ashley when I need her? <laughs> okay, so there's your sticky buns, and we'll get the other, the other batch ready. <laughs> Help! <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it reminds me of. We just won't even go there. But um, anyway. All right, so we'll turn. Just loosen these. So if you see what I'm, just where it's, just want to loosen them because they're really more delicate than muffins. And then they should just come right out. There we go. There we go. Sharon, could you hand me one of those white trays? Are you going to go on and serve them the salad? Okay. Here's these. And like I said, just know that they are missing a little salt in the flour. All right, if you want to finish those. Okay. And I'll get the, the other pan of the minis. Did y'all do the minis already? The little mini muffin ones? Oh, okay, I'll get those back over here. See how the mini ones turned out. Oops, yeah. It's doing it again. You don't want to overfill the pans, I'm realizing that, because this is a sticky um, batter, a little stickier than a muffin batter. Okay. <laughs> that is hilarious. It must be the pressure outside or something. Or the fact that I really shook it with that honey in there. We're really shaking things up here today, aren't I, we? I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> in the... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always sweetened it and then put a little vanilla. Mm -hmm. And I did it. The, uh, I, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe it's revved it up. <laughs> See what coffee does to you? <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, not this sauce. You, I mean, you could if you wanted to. The, the cream sauce that you had for breakfast, yeah, a little whiskey in it. Mm -hmm. These are stuck. This was in, in Scotland where the sauce that originated, it, it's so cold in Scotland and Ireland that, you know, a lot of farm workers would have been out working in the farm, so they would have come in you know, for their breakfast and that whiskey sauce would just warm them up before they headed out for more, for more work. So that was kind of why the Scots and the Irish love their whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, the recipe is actually Victoria Sandwich uh, Cupcake that is in my cookbook, but that's, that's our signature, the Victoria Sandwich Cake is like our signature 
a cake and I would imagine if you make it with Sue's flour it's going to be so much better because oh, yeah. I have I have to be honest with you the the flour in American flour it hasn't produced the the way I used to, to make Victoria sandwich in the UK using the same ingredient but with Sue's with her freshly ground you know flour they're going to be you're going to get that same flavor but it's basically a standard obviously Queen Victoria it's a, it's a British cake but in Ireland because of the links between the UK and, uh, and Ireland we've so many of the, the similarities because I think the sticky toffee pudding it's an English recipe in origin but yeah it's one of our classic desserts in Ireland uh, but the it's basically cla classic which cream the butter and sugar you know and the flour egg very very simple but the Victoria sandwich uh, butterfly cupcake I have is, is adorable if you have a look in the in the, the bakery section, I think I have it uh, cut it like a little butterfly, so you can take a look at that that recipe. All right, but it's in the book. It's in the book, yes. Okay. It's in the cookbook, yes. But I can't wait to make it with your yeah your flour. Well, I've done several things. I'm I'm hoping to make the the shortbread uh, for Christmas for the Christmas class, and um, and then we're gonna make the chicken salad. Oh, for the brilliant. for the Christmas yeah. class, yeah, it's curry and um, uh, pureed apricots. Mm -hmm. It's really really good. I have very, the recipe for southern chicken salad, and then I have a UK southern uh, chicken salad, again showing the similarities between the southern culture and the UK. That in the American South, you all love your chicken salad, but we we love chicken salad as well, and it's showing the similarities in the cultures, but yet the the different recipes. So both, both of those are in the, I think it's the tea party chapter. But there's all recipes that are nice for hosting a, a classic uh, Irish Southern tea party. <laughs> all right. I think our ribs are about down, so we can get them going here. A little bit more pressure here. So there's our sticky toffee pudding. And like I said, aren't the in that little pan cute? It makes it look like bells. Until this pressure goes down, you cannot open this pot. So there's no way you're going to open this and have it blow up on you. That's another safety feature. How is it? Y'all are eating. It's an old mommy trick. Starve you and you'll eat anything. No. Should be delicious. I know this summer I was having a great time just putting, I, I make, my kids really like Caesar salad and Caesar salad typically is just lettuce and croutons and Parmesan cheese and the dressing. So this summer though I just went, forget it, I'm putting all kinds of stuff on. So I put blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, um, different fruit, maybe a slice of meat if we had some leftover chicken and stuff. So get creative just because Caesar salad usually only has lettuce and croutons doesn't mean you can't jazz it up if that's the dressing that you like. And I do that when I go out. If I order Caesar salad when I'm out, I'm like, can you put some cucumbers and tomatoes and some vegetables on there? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> All right. So here's our, ooh, look at this. Even though it's been sitting here, mm -hmm. it is bubbling. Okay. Um, Caleb, do you have tongs over there? Or are they uh, over here? Those aren't, don't grab as well. Take out, take out the, the bay leaf. Yeah. Kitchen towel. They probably went to the kitchen. I just don't know if they Thanks. came back. It's over there. She's saying, Maggie's saying it's over there. 
They're over there. Okay. Thank you, huh? So you can see the the meat is just is just uh, falling off the bone. That's you just to going to put the meat there, and then we'll. And I could maybe I could even puree the, the vegetables. Yeah, it, which I would be think nice. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. she's got a question. Thanks. Yeah. Well, in in restaurants normally you just uh, ginger, would, would strain them, just strain them. So it basically the the juice, you know, that, that this would only be flavouring the vegetables. It would only be flavouring. But what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to puree the vegetables in with this for the sauce, you know, so that we're incorporating the the fiber and the vegetables in the dish, but but normally in, when it's served in a restaurant style, it would be completely strained, so you just have the, the juice, you know, the, the dew kind of from that. Do you all see how the meat is just literally falling off the bone? So we probably didn't even have to do it, cook it as long yeah. as we did. Yeah. Yes, yeah. No, not because of the, the high heat. It's not that much higher. It's not like we're not ultra pasteurizing. Yes, you're going to lose some nutrients cooking. Okay, so yes, raw versus cooked. Yes, you'll lose some. But I, you know, I personally believe in eating foods all different ways. I think we, there's some foods that actually cooking releases those nutrients and make them more absorbed. So as far as pressure cooking versus regular cooking, you're, you're good. In fact, from what I'm reading about pressure cooking, because you use less liquid, it's an enclosed, you're not losing nutrients to the steam, to the evaporation, and you're not using a lot of liquid. Like I said, those potatoes, we didn't waterlog them and then pour all the water down the drain. Mm -hmm. um, the green beans, I just put a little trivet in the mm -hmm. bottom and a tiny little bit of water, and I, you, you know, they're, you know, I, I eat everything. And so, I think it's it's healthier, and you don't have the oxidation. The vegetables come out really bright and pretty. Um, so, like I said, cooking versus eating raw, sure you're gonna you're gonna lose some, but cooking, pressure cooking versus cooking otherwise, no. It's not like the microwave where the microwave is a whole different science of cooking. It's where you rearrange molecules. Um, that's not what you're doing here. That's not why it cooks faster. You're raising the boiling point of water so it cooks hotter. So, um, yeah. No, no. I have just worked in in basically consulting with rest, with Irish pubs and restaurants that wanted to have authentic Irish food. I kind of know what do we eat in Ireland, so I've, I've done that. I've done consulting work for, for restaurants with us. And I've worked in for regional chef dinners and things where I've sponsored an appetizer and, you know, kind of that type of thing. Because uh, I, I do catering and I have my own, my own business. I want to tell you something about this dish. When when uh, Judith made it for me, I loved it so much. I love the flavor of the broth that I have used this broth, I mean, this same recipe for stew meat, for pot roast. So you don't just have to do ribs if you, if you don't want. And stew meat, it only took about 15 minutes for the cubes of stew. And then, because I'm not pretty like she is, <laughs> I, uh, I just... I just thickened it up, the juice, the sauce, with some, some bean flour. I've, I've scooped the meat out and just, well, actually, the, the stew the meat, I just there? scooped, uh, I just thickened the up the puree, the whole liquid there with um, a little bit of bean flour and then just served it like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. A paste. I don't find that you need to. You know, the southern southern way is to make a paste, you know, just to mix it with a little bit of water. You certainly can, but I find that with the bean flour, if you whisk it in, that it doesn't clump up quite like the, the uh, wheat flour does. 
but you certainly can if you want to make sure. Because like a, some, a lot of times with the vegetables and things in there, because I can't get a good whisk there, that then it will clump up a little bit, but it, it's tasty. It's not like you're biting into, you know, flour, clumps of flour. But, um, so it just depends on what I'm thickening, but I don't, I don't need to make a roux necessarily. Um, I use a white bean flour if I don't want to impart a flavor. So like a garbanzo bean, a lima bean, um, uh, lima bean, garbanzo bean, great northern. Those are my white beans. Um, for a dark like this, I might would use black eyed pea flour because that'll be dark. So it'll, it'll keep it dark. Um, it just depends on what I have on hand. I've used uh, 16 bean soup mix. Right in the mill. Yes, you can mill the beans into flour. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. You can use the Wonder Mill for corn was the question. Yes, and popcorn. Mm -hmm. In fact, I did it last night. We had potato soup and corn muffins last night for dinner. You must have been thinking Ireland with the potato soup. Too. Yeah, I guess. It was cold. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew. That's why Irish eat soup and drink whiskey and it's all to stay warm. See, there's logical <laughs> reasons for all of this. In the south, you're always trying to stay cool. It's the yeah. opposite. It's like the iced tea. and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... In where my, my sons, we adopted our sons from Latvia, and of course they don't, I mean, you go in and you get drinks and they don't give you ice. And sometimes the drinks are cold and sometimes they're not. Um, but my son, uh, my older son was over the other night for dinner and, and uh, I had cooked dinner and I said, would, would someone get drinks on the table? And so my son just started putting water in the glasses or tea or whatever we had with no ice. And my Latvian son goes, this is America, David. You put ice in the glasses. <laughs> he was quite adamant he, that that drink needed ice. This is America, he said. Any questions? And Judith will, um, we'll get this plated, and then Judith will stay and uh, sign your books mm -hmm. if you want. And um, if you need... One for Thank gift, you. she'll, you know, you sign Thank that you. too. But you're going to love, love, love this, this broth here. And like I said, I loved having the carrots and the ca apples, and it, it all tasted the same. My sons always go, they go, oh, we don't like cooked carrots. And I'm like, it all tastes like the broth. What do you mean you don't like cooked carrots? <laughs> Just add that that meat back into that then, or, um, Kate, or else uh, drizzle it. Do you want me to sauce? add the meat back in and dip it out, or do you want to just um, plate it and drizzle? Do you want to drizzle the drizzle? Yeah. yeah. I mean, at okay. home yeah. I would put the meat back in, yeah. but just to yeah. make sure y'all all get meat, um, we're gonna plate it like this. So we'll put a little so meat on the mashed more, potatoes. Some more meat there. Yeah, I was even wondering if just we wanted put it into to, puree, or, or do we want to put it on here? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, I will, um, you can either go around and sign their books while we're playing, okay. or you can keep answering okay. questions. We are officially done. Unless y'all have any questions, we'll get the food plated and bring it around to you. But I'll turn it over to 